Welcome back to Bulletproof Mindset, your go-to podcast for health, fitness and entertainment. Today we have a very special guest, one that I was really excited to sit down and dive into our story, and that is the lovely Kerry Smith. Now Kerry joined us for almost, I think it's just about a two-hour episode, and you're in for a whirlwind of um, a really inspiring and interesting story on how Kerry managed to get into personal training and the fantastic work that she's doing with her clients and the older senior population. Now what I like about Kerry is there's a lot of emphasis put on building a strong body, not just a, a shredded body and that was one of the main talking points in today's episode. Now Kerry coaches out of a gym in uh, Edinburgh at Bannantines but she is also an online coach and does a lot of work with the uh, senior population. I'm going to leave a link below as usual to her social channels, definitely a page worth following if you want some sort of wholehearted, wholesome content. Uh, she doesn't believe she posts a lot, but the stuff that she does post, honestly, it's one of them where, you know, those feel-good stories that you come across on TikTok or Instagram, Kerry's page is all about that. Uh, she also got a good wee bit of banter and all that in her stories. And also, with Kerry being a personal trainer, she does coach online, so if you're someone who's maybe interested and really likes her story and feel you can relate a lot to what Kerry was saying, then definitely check it out, and if she's someone that you want to work with, check the link below. And one last thing before we get into the episode, I know there might be a few new listeners here coming over from Kerry's social channels or whatever, so I need a favour from you. One of the best ways and free ways you can support this show is by leaving a 5 star rating on Spotify. I'm on the road to 300 and it would mean the world to me if you could leave a 5 star rating. If you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing or at the very least like the video and comment below your favourite part on today's story. I release episodes every Monday and Thursday. I've done this for the last two years and I'll continue to do for the next several years. It's something I'm so passionate about and everything that we spoke about in Kerry's journey is one of the reasons I wanted her on because I believe so many more people should be lifting weights to get stronger and building a more resilient body as opposed to just focusing on diet and fat loss. Both are absolutely fine to do but one of them is going to increase our chances of having a more quality driven life. So if you could do that, mean the world to me. But without further ado, enjoy today's episode. So uh, you've also podcasted over the last year. Uh, is this the first podcast since then? Yes. Yeah, it's it nervous this round. Doing not too bad. No, I actually feel like honestly, I feel fine this time. Good. Thankfully, I think I was interviewed like a couple of weeks ago for another thing. Oh, cool. I got absolutely just dragged into that. I was oh, like, was no, thank you. No, thank you. It was the one um, where I did loads of classes right, and, and they the were talking about, it, yeah, right, yeah, they were yeah, talking I about loneliness. And I was like, no, I'm fine. I've just done five classes. I'm very sweaty. <laughs> uh, and he was like, no, you're coming and you're talking. You're well, uh, yeah, <laughs> I had, I couldn't look at the mirror or anything. So I was just like, yeah, this is great. Um, but it, it's great. Like those, I love being able to do that. Mm. It's just like pushing yourself to do it is sometimes a bit. Yeah. And you're like, no, I've got nothing to say. So let's, yeah, let's kind of touch on that then to start with. Um, so it's one of the main reasons I, I've been really wanting to get you on um, with the whole, the work that you're doing in the older population. So since, I guess, even just over the last couple of years, it seems like this is becoming more and more a kind of spark within you. It's like, yeah, yeah I want to do that. I oh, do that. Abs absolutely. I love it. What was so t talk about about the recent thing you were at because I seen the highlight reel mm -hmm. that they'd done. So yeah. it, it looked like am I right in saying it was like a community day with different aspects? Yeah, yeah. so it was run by quite a few different charities, mm -hmm. um, and they had basically just brought loads of different um, charities together so that the older people knew what was available to yeah. them. Um, so and I think it kind of aligned with the end of the winter payment, the winter fuel payment. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just about bringing awareness to everything and bringing people together and they have um, a bit of a dance as well so mm -hmm. they're just having the best time it's just about them having fun mm -hmm. um, and then the exercise element of it as well having me there to do the classes with them um, and then that so that's where you were drafted then for your yeah, expertise eh? yeah exactly I just got that's asked to come cool. along I actually didn't know what it was before I had gone. Yeah. And then when I got there, I was like, oh my goodness, there's actually loads of people here. Mm -hmm. So I think it ended up that I I did classes for about 50 people in like a couple hours. Mm. I was like, this is mad. <laughs> it was so cool as well because they'd come from different countries. So All right. I think they were in Edinburgh anyway, but there was, you know, a group of like German older people. And I always do a bit of a dance as well. Mm. Um, my boss was like, I said, should I do the dance? He was like, no, nah, maybe we just won't do it. And then we were doing the exercises and they looked like they were enjoying it. But I was like, nah, they need to be perked up a bit. So I was <laughs> like, I don't know if they're going to know this song. We put on K Sarah Sarah. Right. And honestly, they were like a choir. Like oh, the German it. group sang it so lovely and they just loved it. So then going forward, I just did the dancing with all of them. 
and they were absolutely buzzing. <laughs> that must be so. I mean, it's such a, a kind of wholesome thing that you're doing, and that's that's like what you were just saying off podcast there that you feel your social media is quite crap or your presence in social media is crap. But yeah. that's the thing I get from like your when your reels come out. It's, it is so wholesome, and is, there is something about that with the. I don't know the training training older people. I think a lot yeah. of people there's a the misconception that getting older has to suck and there's obviously complications. But it's like we just write off the older generation and a lot of it's great that we're grown up in a in an age of information and mm-hmm. uh, easy to figure out should we drink from plastic bottles and all this sort of stuff. When these guys uh, in the the kind of later years it's just like right shuffle you into a care home and let you kind of. Yeah. Go to your end, which is exactly. mad. Exactly. That is something that when I speak to them, they do feel like they're invisible sometimes. Do they? Uh, and okay. I, I just feel like we, like younger people often act like it's not coming to yeah. them. And if you're lucky, you will grow old. It's like, it's a privilege, yeah. you know. Um, and it's something that I'm very aware of. And I've never really understood why that's the case. Mm. And I do know, like, maybe some people don't, aren't around older people a lot. Mm. That's another thing is like that I kind of grew up Um, because my mum was a carer and yeah so she was like that was a massive part of my life Mm -hmm. growing up was helping her um and you know you would go in and you would see these older people and you would like I would I just remember like helping restock their cupboards and things and then if someone passed away it was such a a massive thing to learn about when you're younger as well is that relationship with death Mm. You're thinking like I've literally just stocked this person's cupboard. They can't die. Like yeah. they've got all this food to eat. So, um, see, see, going back to that, how when did yeah. you? What age were you when you were? You can remember starting to help your mum out and stuff like that. I think I was like twelve or maybe ten really? or something. And I know, looking back, I was like, yeah, this is just a normal part of life. I wasn't actually doing hard no, of course, work. Okay, yeah. I was just sitting chilling with them while my mum did, you know, made their dinner and did all these things. I don't know if that was allowed, but we did it. And um, I would sit with them and they would just say, your mum is the highlight of my week. Like, she honestly just, she's the only thing. Some of them would say, you know, I, that's what I live for. And I was just seeing your mum week to week or daily, some of them. Um, and I remember just, like, looking at the way my mum was with them. It was, she was so funny and she had, like, like she made them feel so safe, but also with this humour uh, as well. Banner. Yeah, and I just remember thinking, like, it's the first time I felt, like, truly proud of someone. Mm. Even at that age, I was so young, and I remember thinking, like, I want to make people feel like that. Mm. Um, it was, yeah, just so lovely to see that, mm. that she, she was able to do that when someone was at a time in their life where they were, like, so vulnerable and their quality of life wasn't great. Yeah. So, yeah, I can considered like going down that route as well but well, this is what i find really fascinating about your story because this kind of sparked you to figure where your place is in the world and yeah. i think that's quite quite cool so so going back to that where did you grow up did you grow up in the north of scotland am i right yeah right. yeah northeast so a wee place called boner bridge right um which most people haven't heard of what's, what's the population of like a town that size i actually don't know maybe like a thousand right okay people? And is check. that where your mum done the caring and everything? Yeah, right? yeah. So it kind of makes more sense because I think maybe yeah. for the central belt of Scotland, people are like, yeah, you're not allowed to do that. How no. are you getting away with that? I know, <laughs> but I know. I suppose a very close knitted community then. Yeah, right. it was very close knit. Um, so everyone knew my mum. Mm. Like it was just, she basically looked after everyone's parents. I was going to say, imagine it's the <laughs> team of like the same two or three carers if, yeah. they're, if they're lucky. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it was like a tiny, tiny wee village. Mm. Um, so it was, yeah, it was in the, in the village next to our guy as well. So that's where we would do, go and like go around all the houses and Got things. Yeah. So what what is it like growing up in that that part of Scotland? Um, I think it's it's good. Mm. You know, what? I love I love it up there, and I love visiting. But I think when you get to like your teenage years, mm-hmm. when I got to about seventeen, I was like, there's actually nothing to do here. Mm. You know, growing up, I remember going into like. Just we would phone numbers from the phone box, and that was like the like, yes, this is <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> yeah, it was like, what are we actually doing? Uh, there's nothing to do. Mm. There's like a wee spar, and then even like the pubs were kind of there's no not really any pubs up mm. there anymore. So when you got to that age, when you got to eighteen, you're like, okay, there's nothing for me mm. here anymore. Um, so I had to. So we always did. You always have your eyes set on kind of moving out and moving away. 
Yeah, so I went to uni, so yeah. I applied to do social sciences at uni. So that was um like I knew that was that's what I wanted to do. But social sciences again, it was one of those ones where you don't really understand what it is. It's like everything, mm. everything in a degree. So I knew that I was leaving and at least it was gonna get me, you know, into a city. So was that the was that the main kind of driver? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was uni. What's well, like so Obviously, it sounds like your mum was a massive role model for you growing yeah. up. And obviously, sadly, um, when she passed away then. What age did she pass away at? Uh, 54. Uh, no, what age were you, sorry? Oh, I was sorry. 27. Right, yeah. okay. So she passed away quite quite young. What yeah. Was that? Was it anything to do health-related? Yeah, so she had lung cancer oh. um, that got caught really, really late. Mm. Um, so she actually hadn't even officially been diagnosed when she got really ill. Mm -hmm. Um, but she, yeah, so she got pretty ill, um, and then it was the same year, it was 2019, that she started to feel worse. Okay. Um, and she was still caring, doing all these things, but, you know, over time she was just kept getting signed off work mm -hmm. with, and they thought it was like a pulled muscle and all these different things. Um, and then, yeah, she, she, we just knew something was wrong and she went then for the scans and the x-rays and it just, it started to progress so so quickly um so i think i had just so i i had managed a bar before that i was working in hospitality and it was just at that point i was thinking i need to get out like what am i actually doing and uh yeah i was saying to her about like working with older people and i said you know caring and she was like carrie darling you are a very caring person but i just don't think that you would enjoy that as a job. I don't think you're cut out for it. Is that what you, like, is it maybe do you think that's why you'd never pursued that initially? Oh Mom yeah. Was kind of fighting against it. Definitely. Interesting. Yeah. I think she she knew it was maybe a little bit too hard work for me. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, yeah. So I did consider it. Cause you think like that's maybe the only route mm. would be going into a care home or something like that. So but I'm really glad that I did actually get to tell her that I, I wanted to be a personal yeah. trainer and that's the route I wanted to go down. Um, I seen on your your Instagram um, a couple. Of, I think the anniversary was a couple of months back. Am I right in saying? Yeah, in July. Um, yeah. And this is, I think, this is one of the kind of fascinating about the times that we grow up in. That technology, we can still have messages, video messages, yeah. and all that. Because you always hear in the mo the old movies, it's like mm. playing the same voicemail. But you still yeah. get texts from your mum that you that yeah. you often look back on. Absolutely. What's that like? Oh, it's. And I wish voice notes were a I thing know. back then. That's the thing that annoys me so much. And videos, even no, back no, then, videos weren't such a, you know, TikTok wasn't so much of a thing. Um, not that she would have been on TikTok, but... Um, doing the dances. Yeah, <laughs> doing some sort of dance. But the, the messages, you know, when you see, like, someone's personality come through in it, I look back on them so much and just... Because they do apply. They still apply yeah. now, you know. She was so funny. Mm. So I just, like, screenshot them and just imagine Keep that them, she's sending the them box, yeah, yeah now because she always she was quite like sentimental and very spiritual and all all that so she would say things like you know i'm always with you my spirit's with you and, and now i'm just thinking that i'm looking at it, like holding on to it um so yeah she was a massive influence for me like going into this when you when you guys were growing up how what was the household like so mum and dad together and yep. all this sort of stuff yeah Mum and dad um, together. How did they move up to that part of the world? What's what's like their story? So they've always been up there in right, different okay. parts. Yeah, they're like Highlanders through and through. Interesting. Um. So yeah, my dad. My dad is sixteen years older than my mum. All right. They are. Um. Right. <laughs> but he no, he worked on the rigs. So that was his. You know everything he did. Uh, when I was growing up, mm -hmm. and then. It's so difficult with that because when you get laid yeah. off from that, it's a massive, massive thing. And that, I think that was a massive thing for him. Um, he actually went into caring as well. So, oh, did he? Yeah. So um, the, did I get, so I take it when they were shifting and moving the sort of, the rigs and that sort of stuff, that's when that. Yeah. So it was, it was onshore mm -hmm. um, and they closed it down. So then it's like you say up there, there's just nothing like yeah. there's no other so job. How do you pivot? Like you yeah, have to move, get up get and live your life. Kind of forced into into another job. So he was looking after um, disabled people. So it was a different, you know, slightly different. But um, yeah, so he did that for until he retired. Mm -hmm. um, and mum just continued to do her caring and um, 
Yeah, that was... So it sounds like in your... Are you an only child? No, I've got so a sister who drove me here today. Oh, thank, yeah, oh of course, you said that. <laughs> she's been roped in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's, she's here. Is she older or younger? She's younger. Right, so yeah. you growing up then, um, what was it like kind of... Was your mum and dad very supportive of you moving away and experiencing life a little yeah. bit then? Did they support that? Absolutely. Like, my mum was terrified of, mm, I can imagine. like me doing anything i went um to new zealand i randomly decided i was going to go traveling solo and she was just like kind of like push pull thing she was like i'm gonna pay for your flights but please just promise me you will not skydive you won't bungee jump you're like yeah of course mom. yeah i'm like sure <laughs> luckily i did run out of money and i <laughs> couldn't, couldn't actually do, do those things um but she always as much as she had all those anxieties like she never held me back mm. she always and and i kind of growing up like I did have a lot of self-doubt that was something that you know and I still do struggle with that to some degree but she was always like Carrie if you just had a little bit more like self-belief you would be dangerous Mm -hmm. like that was always a little thing that she said to me um and I always think about that now because you know as much as she was worried about anything that I would do Mm -hmm. she would never stop me and she would actually push me to do it Mm -hmm. which is um so valuable when you're growing up yeah what's life like when you shift from a small little village up north and come down to Edinburgh to this. I would imagine growing up, you'd maybe visit holidays and things like that. You got to experience a bit of that life. Yeah, I did. I mean, I don't think I went to the cinema until I was like 17 or 16 or something. Why is there so many people here? (laughs) (laughs) There was this massive screen. Um, That was in Inverness. So Inverness was the closest Mm. city. But yeah, it is, it's so different. Mm. You know, you do, you feel like you're a completely different, like, species coming out here you're like is it Amish or whatever yeah it is, yeah. yeah exactly like you're all used to this like McDonald's I remember my, having my first McDonald's like it was I wasn't that old I'm making myself sound like an alien but I just remember thinking god this is so different we didn't even have we don't have takeaways in, in Bowen, I was gonna right? say take it was things you don't think about yeah I re, uh, so we done the NC 500 so uh-huh. I don't know if we would have went through I think we would have yeah so John O'Groats across the Thurso is it on yeah is it on yeah so it would have been it's further so it uh, John O'Groats is north, oh, so, right, it's so it's further down, below, yeah. Right. And even driving there, I was thinking, man, to get to like a mainstream supermarket, we're yeah. 110 miles. <laughs> like, that's it. Way. There's no supermarkets. Like, yeah. it's there's just nothing. So life to move into Edinburgh, mm-hmm. I take it went into dorms and all that sort of stuff. What was yep. what was that experience like for you? Was that because you don't have a lot of self-belief then at this point? Or mm-hmm. is the sort of kind of the younger teenage self just like yeah I'm just gonna go with the flow like what was what was your personality like there um to be honest like so I went to Inverness before I went to uni okay which and I worked in a bar for the oh, first, was that that time right. yeah so just before which gave me a lot of confidence but I think it actually made me feel like I was a little bit further forward with like my independence and all that and then when you go into halls you feel like you've taken a step back so I felt very frustrated when I went to uni in what way I just felt like I was back like in school almost in a way. It was really strange. Like you're in That's halls very authoritative. with loads of people. Yeah. Um, and I'd experienced living in a flat and doing what I wanted and making money as well. Because when you go to uni, you're so skint. <laughs> um, I was still working, but yeah, it kind of, it was a bit weird of a weird one. The fir- first year of uni, I just, I did not enjoy it at all. I hated it. Really? Um, did I you don't stick it through? Know why. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, right. I did. I graduated. Um, I stayed all the way through, and I'm so glad I did because fourth year was my favorite. Right. Like up until third year, I was like, "This is just awful." And I think doing doing a degree that you're not 100 percent sure mm-hmm. what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know this is great, and I love psychology, sociology, history, politics, but why is it everything? Like, uh, what am I actually doing? Um. So then, when you get to fourth year, you kind of more go down one route. Um. And I stuck to more the the sociology mm-hmm. um direction. And that's when I started thinking, because I remember sitting down one day thinking, what am I going to do for my dissertation? Like, what, you could do anything. Some, I think some degrees they tell you, mm-hmm. like they give you a, a, a few Yeah, but options. they kind of leave a broad range for yeah. you to choose from. Uh, I think I, I read know. something on LinkedIn. Did you do yours on like the female bodybuilding? Oh, is that right? on yeah. there? Yeah, I'm so, literally <laughs> so I, I do a wee bit of research before it oh came God, up and I was yeah. like, is this the right Kerry Smith? And then I clicked on it. I was like, oh, She's this, got a yeah. degree, <laughs> Jesus. Um, yeah, so I what made you choose that? that. Well, I sat down one day in Starbucks and I remember thinking, um, what am I, what do I actually enjoy? Like, what is it I like? And I remember thinking, like, I really like fitness. I actually love fitness. And then 
I thought, well, I could do anything. So why don't I do something about bodybuilding mm. with sociology and like think about how building muscle um, changes like your identity or how you feel or how other people see you. I love that. So that was the first thing that I did. And mm. I was like, wow, that, I should have known then. Yeah, the, 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 I think the writing's on the wall when you're kind of going back through your story. Yeah, that was 2015. Yeah. <laughs> right. When did you make the leap eventually? 2020 right so hi so yeah that was a long time to be like plodding along not really knowing i, I think like w so you are going through your 20s at this point yeah mm -hmm. and yeah i honestly think the more and more people I interact with and speak with i didn't make the leap until i was 27 28 yeah and the more i think it's like oh, i could have made that sooner i should have made that sooner so i had oh. similar to you and i was 17 18 there was something with a mate wanted to do personal training yeah. but it's just like nah i can't really do that but your 20s is all about experience and i think i know you just evolve into that yeah and you take it more that. seriously i remember speaking to the i met up with the guy that the tutor that ran the course the pt qualification and i said i was 27 and i was like am i too old just be honest and he was like absolutely not too, yeah. really because yeah. you think like you have this vision for what life will look like at 25 and 30 I'm actually curious, what did you think your life would look like being 25 years old or 30, grown up in maybe like a smaller village? Mm, I actually have no idea. Yeah. Like, because I'm trying to think back to even what I thought I would do as a job. I remember I wanted to be a PE teacher. That was another thing. I should have known. Yeah, like, okay. But it just went, because I think your teachers in school are so important as well. Mm -hmm. So I had a PE teacher that I loved. And then I had a PE teacher that I just didn't get on with very well. And I, and then I just felt like I couldn't do it. Mm. So I think that that maybe if that had continued, I would have actually gone down that route quicker. I was inspired by the, the PE teachers for sure. I just thought, yeah. what a cool job to have. Like, just play sports all day. I know. Just have fun with fitness. Mm. So what's your experience with fitness then? Like, so I've seen your skills with the football and all that sort of stuff. So. <laughs> Is that where, like, what talk us through, like, from childhood up till up till kind of you know what was what was that side? Yeah, so I was always naturally just quite sporty. Like, um, I like growing up, it was always my mum would. So Michelle, my sister, would be learning how to cook and sew and all of that, all and right. my mum would say, "I would just see Carrie's legs flying past the window doing cartwheels in the <laughs> garden." So very energetic. Yeah, then. we right. were just so different. Mm. Um. And now she, Michelle has those skills and I don't, <laughs> I'm trying. Um, but yeah, I was just always on the go. And like in school, um, I did like athletics and things. And I absolutely loved that. That's something I wish I, I continued mm -hmm. Did like high jump and triple jump and, and all of that. So did your school get to go anywhere with that sort of stuff? So that's some, that's an yeah. opportunity we kind of get a wee bit more of down here. Yeah. Uh, we don't, I mean, you do the, the competitions, like the North of Scotland stuff, like, mm -hmm. And I went to all them. But then beyond that, there's no one Nothing. really pushing you. Mm. Um, I wish that I got just a little bit more of a push mm. to, to continue that because I just didn't, I couldn't do it by, by myself. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I just, that was something that kind of stopped after after high school. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it was so good and I loved it. And that was definitely what kind of, triggered me wanting to get into fitness like there's little bits along the way little that started it yeah was yeah. there anything else from like high school that you kind of thought of like this would be a good job to do when you're older or was it all fixated around PE or something to do with I think um sociology. yeah so I started I was really into dancing as well that was something that I loved in in primary school and then into high school mm -hmm. um and it was, I think in primary school, there was talk of me like going, then going forward, going to dance school as well. Um, but I was so, I was just, no one else was going to go. And I was like, I can't go by myself. This is too scary. And then I got to high school and I remember I was like performing, like rehearsing for a performance. And I just got this weird feeling. It was like an electric shock through my body. I was like, that was really weird. What was that? And uh, these things kept happening. And I couldn't, I couldn't physically like learn the dances because these right. weird things kept getting triggered. And then uh, I went to the doctor and I got tests for so long and they didn't know what it was for ages until it was 2018, I got diagnosed with epilepsy. Ah, I was right, having so, these tiny oh, okay. little seizures, right. but that actually stopped me being able to do any of the, the dance stuff. Yeah. Um. So I do wonder sometimes like that's a route that I probably would have gone down if if Perfect. I had done it in primary school, yeah. and then yeah, so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's like the 
getting the kind of diagnosis with epilepsy. So you mentioned there you've just got your license back. Yeah, I so just got exciting. my license. Yeah. I know, I know. I've not. Is that driven a bit of a bummer so. then when all that happened? Oh yeah, it was. I'm so glad I did my driving before. So I was 24 when I did it, mm-hmm. um, and it it was a bit of a weird one because I'd been having these episodes for years and years, but there was no answer. I was getting test after test. And what was the episodes? Was it like zoning out, or was it like? sharp shaking or it's like so they they're called focal onset seizures and it's a small like a small part of your brain i don't even want i don't want to go into it because i don't want to say anything wrong Mm. with the actual like what's going on but i know my experience with it was it was just almost like so the trigger was cognitive loading which is basically doing anything (laughs) but it would almost be if i was like having to think ahead of something so like thinking of choreography mm. is a good example um and something in my brain it would just short circuit uh-huh. like i would get a little like muscle jerk and then some of them would be worse some of them would be you know not too bad but it would just happen anytime i i did any of that and were you um, aware of it yeah yeah, yeah so fully aware yeah. fully awake so yeah i just remember getting um a test done and it was just one that came back and it said abnormal brain activity or something yeah. it's like <laughs> sounds um, like me <laughs> yeah it's like yeah that's about right so then they were like yeah we're you know you're not gonna be able to drive yeah. until you're like a year seizure free so that and was, did you get any like was the medication or was there anything to work on like how yeah. did you go into remission with it then so i took i tried loads of different medications yeah, but the because my epilepsy was so mild the side effects were way worse than the actual seizures uh, themselves yeah so because I wasn't driving you know it wasn't a danger um so I tried all these medications and they just affected my memory they affect your moods there's one called Capra where you get Capra rage um I don't think I like roid rage yeah yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I can't tell because I'm so angry anyway (laughs) um but yeah I just like I can't I can't deal with this so I just came off all the medication. Lifestyle, you know, I, I spoke to a neuropsychologist, which was amazing, and she just said, like, the fundamentals of sleep, hydration. You just know, about all to say, stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, how she, much did that play an impact then? Yeah, she said, like, this is so important. She actually got quite annoyed at me. She's like, you're not taking this seriously enough. Like, you need to focus on this so much. Like, your stress levels, all of this is actually making it so much worse for you. So, you need to make sure that you're keeping on top of it. Um, and yeah, I was like, this is what I'm telling people all the time. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's the four main powers. Yeah. Everybody looks at the the new gimmick on the market of the different things that we can do, yeah. type of diet, type of exercise, resistance, whatever. And it's like this, this main pillars, stick to them mm-hmm. first and see what happens. Exactly. So what, what do you think that was happening? What was lifestyle like at this point? So obviously... That was the same year that your your mum had, did that play a part or was it just more the combination of university to try to figure out where you want mm-hmm. to do in life, like what's going on? Yeah, I think it was, I was working in a bar at the time, uh. Uh, like that's what I did after uni and I was trying to figure things out. Did you go to the bar because you'd done that before or was that like in... Uh, I went, because I was, when I was at uni, I was just like part-time job, right. that's fine. And then I went travelling to try and find myself. Mm. I didn't find anything. I didn't find How long were you away from New, Ze- um, just New Zealand? You done yeah, that? three months. Oh wow! Yeah, good. so it was New Zealand, Australia for a couple of weeks, and then Dubai on my way home. Very nice. But yeah, I just don't think. You see, when you yeah. say like go find like if you're not feeling great, I don't think it's a good idea to go like somewhere where you don't know anyone by yourself. So you, I'm um, seen on your stories. You were talking about solo traveling, or someone asked you a question yeah, about solo traveling. Yeah. So this makes sense where this comes from. Then so yeah. you've done a bit of it. So you you done this solo then, just one way yeah. flight. So wing it, or? I knew, like, I had a friend who was in New Zealand at the time, so I at least knew when I got there that I would know someone. But it was never the plan to like travel together the whole time. Mm-hmm. But I just, yeah, I just came out of uni and thought, what am I doing? I need to I need to figure this out. So why don't I just go to the other side of the world? <laughs> I'd never even been on a long haul flight. Oh, do you not? No. <laughs> straight that in the deep like, end. Right, okay. Um yeah, straight in. So I went and yeah, it was great, but I just came back skint and confused. What can so let's talk about like what were some of the things that you didn't expect or one of the things you were maybe expecting to happen that didn't quite happen while you were away? Did it just become like trying to seek 
out like friendships and all that mm. sort of stuff or was it just like I'm um, I am not finding any sort of inspiration from anyone here I think like I felt older I was only like 24 23, 23 but everyone was like 18 well I did a, like the Kiwi experience which is the the bus tour thing all right, cool. and I think a few of those there was a lot of people I think what actually bothered me was these people seemed like they knew what they were doing they seemed like they had a plan and I didn't, and I thought, oh my god, I'm this old, and I don't have... <laughs> 24 years <laughs> yeah, old. Yeah, <laughs> I'm 24, I'm getting on, and um, they all seem to know themselves, mm -hmm. and I just got so in my head about it, and I didn't plan it enough, I didn't have enough money that I could actually just enjoy myself. Mm -hmm. I would have been better going out there and working for a bit. Did you work at all then, no? No. Nope. Right, okay. No. Nope. So it was just like a prolonged holiday then? Yeah, it yeah. was. It was like three months of me just panicking. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what am I going to do? Yeah, but I did. I loved it and I met some amazing people, but I just don't think it was quite the right time. I, I tend to be a bit impulsive sometimes and that was yeah, a big example of that. Coming back from that experience then, what was, were you nervous? Were you feeling like a bit low and a bit of a, like, these, this sort of like failure feeling and all yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I was just feeling like... I think well I my the manager from the bar got in touch with me when I was on my way back and said do you want to come back to the bar as a manager and I just thought okay a bit of stability you know a bit of like an, an income would be Something really good you know well. yeah. yeah so I think that was just a bit of a comfort for me on my way back so I thought I'll just go back to the bar and do that um and just figure out because something wasn't right and I, I had to figure out what that was um, and you kind of look at everything in your life and you're figuring out I was in a relationship at the time actually right. when I went away solo travelling right, so okay. that should have been a bit of an indicator that maybe that wasn't <laughs> right you know I'm just going to disappear for a little were you yeah. planning on doing a year or like was it no. did you just not know just go I think because it was so last minute I was like I can afford to do three months that's right. fine right, okay so um, that number stuck yeah yeah every exactly. penny squeezed out to make <laughs> that last exactly right, okay. yeah I was living on uh, like it's weird the things in New Zealand that are cheap that are expensive here is like sushi and Domino's and oh, what? yeah I, Send Dom me there. <laughs> I was like yeah I like put on so much weight when I got back not a bad like, lifestyle I then, know mate. it was it was good it's like tins of tuna and yeah that's about it like noodles <laughs> yeah like two cheap things here so exactly. I'm, I'm assuming the relationship had ended while we were away or no did that no it, it didn't end for a wee while actually in when I got back because again you don't look at these things you always think it's something else or it's and it probably was a combination of things mm -hmm. but um yeah that relationship lasted quite a while after mm -hmm. but it just wasn't it wasn't the right time either it was like I was just not sure what was going on in my life mm -hmm. you know so um I had to take a step back and, and I think I needed to go back to the bar as well to have that I think if I started looking for you know the job that I really want or a career at that point, it would have just been too much pressure. Yeah. Um, oh, you tried with the traveling, like you tried to yeah. get answers and <laughs> nothing was coming out. So no. <laughs> you had to change, change the direction mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah. So you come back and then where, where, where are we in the timeline here? So what age are you when you come back and things like that? Um, I think, yeah, I was about 24. Right, okay. I remember that because I was like, again putting so much pressure on myself mm -hmm. it's like I can't drive and I'm nearly 25 like what the hell <laughs> <laughs> I actually never thought about that before like how much pressure I put myself yeah. on these silly like ages how much would you give to be 25 again I know yeah. I know and then so quick and then passed my test and then my license got taken off me. I was like for goodness <laughs> sake Just give me a break yeah so yeah that was around 25 and then yeah. um it, weirdly and this has just come back to me now I remember when I was working in the bar and I'd just gotten up to go to work and I could hear something like a, a distant like a uh, voice shouting help in the in the flats that that we were in and I was like that's really weird I swear someone's just shouted help and there was um I opened the door and I started shouting out the door like you okay yeah, like I don't know where this up, noise yeah. is coming from or who it is or what it is and um it was a, an older man that was up like the the floor mm -hmm. above and he had fallen and there was no one like replying to him. him and I went up and I sat with him and uh he was like his face was all black and blue and phoned an ambulance and I sat with him and he was like yeah I've not seen anyone in like months and mm. I'm just like by myself and I was like how is this even possible like there's people sitting that uh. have no one um 
and I, it was that that was the moment that I was like, um, I'm going to start volunteering, and then oh, was it? Know. This was sparked this, right? Yeah, so that's I and think, I, yeah. I hadn't even thought about that for so long, but that's so we memory that starts. To yeah, they up, just yeah. popped up there. That's so weird. Um, but yeah, that, that you're right. Like we go about this busy life, try to find our place in the world, and you almost it, it can be quite overwhelming when you think about it. It's like cause when you walk down like the high street or whatever, and you're like. Every single person has their own life here. And yeah. Like, Holy shit. It's like, I'm not exactly a main character here. It's like I we know. all think we're main characters. Yeah, but everyone's got their own individual life. So on to this kind of next chapter of your journey then, you, mm. you this event happens, but you, you start volunteering and this is really where you start to find a bit of a purpose yeah. from the work that you're doing then, yeah? Mm. So what what was the what was it you volunteered for and like how did where did the idea come from? Well, so we know where the idea mm. come from, but choosing the right place, like was it just how do how did I get yeah. involved with this? Yeah, I think um, I looked at a few, because after that had happened um, with that older man, I I kind of thought, I was like, maybe I could just go and visit a few people in this building and I could like do their shopping for them. And then I thought, surely there's something more like official than that. It's probably not the best thing to do, just randomly <laughs> knocking on people's <laughs> doors. Yeah. And then I looked it up and I found, they're, they're called Independent Age um, and they do like befriending. Mm -hmm. So it's just going in and having a, a chat with somebody, just having a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. um, so I signed up for that and you just put in like your interests and, you know, the kind of things you like to chat about. And then you just get matched up with somebody. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I got matched up with a man called John mm -hmm. who was 90 years old and he had lost his wife, I think, two or three years before. Um, he didn't really have any family nearby Um and then, yeah, just went and visited him one day. So this is like the first kind of interaction or the first kind of yep. like putting out there. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier about your self-belief. Where is it at this point? Did you feel like the your, your self-belief was just at a point where it's like, it doesn't matter what I believe, like I just need to do something. It's for yeah. what I like to do. Is that where you were at? Absolutely. Were, were you nervous or was there any sort of apprehension around this? Um, yeah, I was, I was quite nervous because... Right. I just kept thinking like I, I knew that I wanted to be you know working with older people in some way but you still think like, I, again I, I think back to my mum and I wanted to make people feel the way that she made them feel I was like maybe I just don't have that in me though like maybe I'm not able to do that I'm not like um I've not got that confidence in like the caring aspect that she had had because of you know her job so I was nervous going I remember we were because I was with the one of the um, volunteers or the people that worked with the charity and then we went in and I sat down I had my little like badge Ooh, on <laughs> like first day at school yeah. <laughs> and um yeah we just got chatting oh, no one. so see just a little sidetrack see the bar yeah. work that you were doing in bar yeah. management was that like in a day-to-day -day job because that must build some sort of skills in that same direction I would imagine or is yeah. it yeah is it just that chaotic that uh, well, what was the bar like because you get different type yeah, of bars yeah no course. it was a nice bar right, okay. it was a nice bar a gin bar um in edinburgh as well uh, like yeah. in the in the city center so it does it makes you like you know you're speaking to strangers every day, every day. Yeah. yeah exactly and there would be moments where you would see people that would come and they would be by themselves and um and there would definitely be times when I'd be like, this is it's so nice being able to chat to somebody one-on-one -on -one and like in a relaxed environment. And it, I remember thinking as well, it's good that, you know, if you see someone drinking by themselves at the bar, you might think, oh, why are they by themselves? But at least they're not at home mm -hmm. drinking by themselves. I think it's a, a, quite a good thing sometimes. Um, and I'd started volunteering before the elderly uh, charity for um, people with addiction, like mm -hmm. that had yeah. been affected by ad addiction. I remember them saying that as well. It's like, it's the people at home that, you know, the worst, yeah. that are yeah. affected the worst, yeah. Yeah, they exactly. they get nothing else going for them. What yeah. made you go down, like, the charity route and kind of giving back? Is, you, is that, you ever wondered, like, where that kind of wholehearted I'm not giving back <laughs> comes from? I'm not sure, to be honest. I think I think it's just that I knew that I wanted to help people in some way and I, I wanted to figure out what that looked like mm. without then you know, getting a job in that area and thinking, God, I, I can't do yeah, this. Um yeah, feel trapped. So doing, like, there's so many voluntary positions and I think it's so valuable mm -hmm. just to see, like, how other people are living yeah. as well. It just, it gives you so much perspective. Mm -hmm. I would go and visit <laughs> um, 
this woman who you know was affected by alcohol and and drug addiction so it was like going in and sitting with her and hearing you know what her daily life was like and um it it just it makes you appreciate so much you know everything Mm. um and just being able to bring something to their life Mm. even for that hour that you're sitting there with them and being able to you know, just have a chat and you get to know them so well over over that time. Yeah. So there's obviously two things that sort of happens and this is a good skill to have as a personal trainer is not, mm. not wearing the weight of maybe the problems that you're hearing from yeah. clients or whoever you're interacting with. Mm. How, did, how have you found that over, do you think all that resilience was maybe built up through seeing your mum and dealing with like someone passing away when you're yeah. so young and just being like, right, okay, it's a circle of life we can we can mourn and grieve and all that sort of mm. stuff, but not taking it so personally. Where did how have you managed to balance that? Um, I don't know. I think it changes. Yeah. I think sometimes I'm like, God, I am resilient, and then other times it just everything is like you know, it, it's difficult, and you do take on people's mm. like being a personal trainer. There's so many people that you you're such a big part of their life as well in terms of you see them week to week and. Mm nowadays like how many people do you actually see week to week on a like regularly um so i do still find that i take on a lot of a lot of it yeah um but i'd say with relationship with death that's something definitely that i've i've been able to be a lot more resilient Mm -hmm. um with you know my mum passing away and also john passing away because that was a a big you know it was five years seeing him every week Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a part of my job that I have to accept, you know, that the people I work with are a lot older um, and it's the reality of it, which is, you know, is heartbreaking. But knowing that you've got that impact, you you can have a positive impact when. Yeah, how does the last couple of years look or even the last yeah. couple of months? I think it's so, it's very emotional to think about, but at the same time, it's like if there was two options, you know what option you're going to take exactly. if it's going to positively increase it. So back to John then, because John is the, he seems to be the the spark that lit the fire in you to go, hey, I want a bit of this, I want to do this as a career. So talk about that relationship unfolding. So you get to get to find out a wee bit more about him. Mm. He's in his 90s and um, he seemed like such a character, such a, a, like an an open book, but also a positive force. Mm. Um, What was, what was he like if you had to kind of like sum him up? John... He was just so, so somebody who's in their 90s, like you do find sometimes that they don't talk about their emotions so much or, but John just wasn't like that. He was really sentimental and he was just had such a softness to him, you know, Um, and he was always coming up with inventions mm-hmm. i would go in and he would just be like right so i've bought a banjo lele and i was like what is that it would just be like random instruments or he'd be like i've i've figured out a new um exercise that i can do and he'd start like throwing a, a a ball like a yoga ball off the wall um which actually fell on top of me doing that trying to show me i think he was yeah, trying he to show off he could have been the f- <laughs> first early pioneer of high rocks when you think yeah about it. i know it's a wall ball it's a wall <laughs> ball yeah exactly so he's absolutely nailing this ball off the wall and then yeah maybe just was showing off too much and then yeah. fell but he was fine um and yeah he was just something else he was always trying to do something he was always just had this positivity that i just i couldn't believe it mm. it was amazing that he had this and and he'd been through so much his his wife had passed away and his brother had passed away not that long after when he was he went to australia to visit him and his brother actually passed away when he was there oh wow well. Um, so yeah, he'd just been through so much, but he was just such a character. Um, and it was always just like giving me advice and he was, you know, so caring. And when my mum passed away, I was still visiting John. I was going to ask you, where is this in the timeline? So yeah, when you see, when you start to do this, what would, when you tell your mum and dad that you're going to do this, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, she's coming down the same route as us at all. Yeah. Like what was yeah. that conversation like? How did that look? Oh, well, they, they loved the idea yeah. of it, I think. Mum was like, no, this is fine. This is good. Go in, have a cup of tea, have yeah. a laugh, leave. And an exit plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she loved the idea and she knew it was something that I was, like, just so drawn to and I was just figuring it out. Um, and she was a massive help because if, if he had something wrong, like, you know, yeah. 
you know, at some in point. Your pocket. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. She was like, okay, so if it was like social services or whoever it was, she would kind of help me mm. with where I could, um, who I could get in touch with to help mm. him with certain things. So I think, yeah, I think she was delighted that I was kind of figuring things out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So the idea for kind of fitness in the elderly. So this came from like the John go to some yeah. sort of class. Yeah, he went to a class. He went to um, a steady steps class. And he came back and he said, yep, so I've been to a, a, an exercise class. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. What like, were you doing? What were you doing? <laughs> yeah, he was like, well, we were marching. We were all sitting, but we were marching and we were imagining that we were marching up a hill. And there was a guy just in front of us and he was really funny. And he was just saying, you know, you're going, you're climbing like Mount Everest or something. And I thought, that... Someone's doing that as a job. Yeah, that sounds like I want, I want to do that. Um, and then he said afterwards, I just had, um, we had tea and biscuits. And he said, I loved it. Like, and he said, I just loved that. I, I got to be around people and I got to have a chat with people as well after. And that was a massive part for him was mm. the, the social aspect of it. So then I thought, oh my God, like fitness and then working with older people as well. I can do that. Yeah, I like, could definitely do idea. that. Yeah. yeah. And it just came to me like So what was that. The, what was your journey like after that then? What do you what did did you reach out to find who was doing that or did you just go right, let me get PT in somewhere? Yeah. It was just personal training. I thought I'm not gonna get ahead of myself because I think I really wanted to protect that as well. I was worried if I jumped into it and I didn't like it because that was like yeah, I my thought, ties with yeah. Um, so I thought I'll become a personal trainer and I'll just figure it out from there. So I met up with that tutor and I said, "Look, I think I'm too old to do this, <laughs> but um, I want to be a personal trainer and I want to help older people." Mm. And he was like, "Wow, no one ever knows their niche like before sure, they even yeah. do it." But I, you know, it was the plan from the get go. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then I just did my PT and then worked in a gym and just started just trying to be a better PT. Obviously, it was around lockdown. That, yeah. yeah, it was around lockdown. Mm -hmm. So you, the gym that you joined, it, am I right in saying that closed down and all that yeah. sort of stuff as well? Yeah, yeah, that closed down. So tons, so there's more speed bumps to come. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when you made the decision to go down the PT route, what uh, did you get? You said you got the chance to say to your mum and. Yeah, sort of yeah. It was just uh, before I started the course. I said to her, "What the? What was? What was like the reception with that sort of stuff?" Because I, I can imagine, like coming from a conference, like you can get paid for doing fitness I know. stuff. I thought, yeah, I didn't think that was a real job. <laughs> exactly. But when I brought it up, like that, I was thinking about going into fitness. Literally, everyone was like, "Well, obviously." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Really? Like yeah. I didn't?" But everyone's just like, "Yeah, well." this is obviously like this is what you're kind of like naturally drawn to anyway and you know I'd gone to the gym loads and I loved all of that um unfortunately when with mum she was getting so ill to the point that yeah. she couldn't really you know really take any of that in she knew she just kept saying make sure you get the money to pay for it I want to pay for it like she just kept saying that yeah, she the last thing yeah. yeah I was like the last thing I want to be thinking about right now is money like mm. that was absolutely not on my mind you know um but yeah I wish I had a wee bit more time there to just kind of like tell her about it and tell her my plans mm -hmm. but she'll know about them anyway yeah, yeah. Where, was that quite difficult to deal with being so far away was there ever a part within you that wanted to move home during this whole time yeah yeah so me and my sister spoke about it we we were going to move home mm -hmm. um but it all happened so fast yeah. it was literally from April she started to get a bit of a cough mm -hmm. um and then by yeah June, she she'd then got the X rays. Which, like I said, she'd been signed off work and things um, a few times in that time. And then by June, that's when they did the X rays, and they said they they said prepare for the worst. You know, I'll never forget those words because that's like it yeah. went from nothing to to that. So she passed away on the first of July, um, and we had only it only been a few weeks that we had kind of known that it was that bad. So we just, me and my sister said, we're going to, you know, move home and just do whatever we need to do. And then, um, yeah, I stayed home within that time. Something, you know, your gut instinct, something was like, just stay, don't go. Because I, I was like, I could do with going back and working for a little bit and then coming back. But my gut was just like, don't, don't leave. So can I was imagine just, the hold and how torn you can be of like, what do you do? 
Like, oh. do, you, do, you, do you go live your life and do your thing because that's yeah. what mum's pushing you to do? Or, like, is, is there an instinctual thing of, like, hanging around here? Yeah, because there was part of me that was like, it can't be that bad. Like, you know, she can't be that ill mm -hmm. um, that these next few weeks are going to matter that much. But you in disbelief when it happened? Because your mum was yeah. really young. When yeah, you think about absolutely in shock, like completely in shock by it all because we didn't even, you know, when you think about cancer, you do imagine more of like a long, yeah, you know, chemo, the, yeah all going that through all that. Yeah. And she hadn't even been diagnosed. Mm. So, you know, when I was with her and she kept saying, she's like, Carrie, you're like my bodyguard. You just won't, I can't shake you off. It's like, I don't know what it is, mom, but I just can't leave your side. Yeah. Like, Are you spiritual? Yeah, 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 definitely. You've always been spiritual or has that became more? No, I always have been. Right. Always have been. My mum always kind of, she lost her brother when she was really young and I think there was always that belief, you know, that, that everyone, energy stays around and they're always watching over you. And um, so we kind of grew up with that as well. So yeah. it was nice to, you know, to believe that as well now. Mm. Um, yeah. So the... When the day that she passed away, what was that like for you guys as a family? I can imagine oh, extremely heartbreaking. It's crazy. It's just, you know, it's that thing of like when you step out the door um, and everyone's living their life and life just goes on and you're looking around and you're like, wait a second, no. Like, how does it, people not know like what's just happened? Literally my world's just like falling apart. Mm. Um, it's crazy because like, so it all happened very dramatically. You know, I had to call an ambulance from mom, my mum. Like we were at the house and then again, we're so far away from everything. It was Inverness, which is an hour's drive away, Definitely. waiting for the ambulance. And then went to the hospital and they just said, you know, she's... Did she pass away in, at home? In in or the hospital, like, yeah. We managed okay. to make it to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I got in touch with my sister because at this point you don't... Like, I didn't want to worry my sister either. And, and I didn't know how bad it was. Nobody really knew until we were told, like, she doesn't have long left. So then my sister, you know, managed to get to to Inverness, thankfully, from Edinburgh. And then um, my mum held on until she got there. You hear stories about that and you're like, it's so wild, does not it? happen? But she bloody did. I think it's like the there must be an on-off switch within us. I know. That part's... Um, your grandparents you hear it you hear it so much so yeah. often and it's like once you can once the last family member's been facetimed or the last visits there it's like they yeah. passed away like yeah. literally minutes after that it is it's holding on i think it is it's just that moment when they feel like they can let go mm. so we were all there you know my me and my sister and my dad and my granddad as well um is it your granddad your mum's yeah my oh, mum's well, stepdad okay. yeah so how yeah. how did he cope with that so imagine like losing a yeah, a daughter. You always, you can't expect the parent to pass away first. But I think you're in your kind of mid to late, yeah, mid twenties, mid twenties. Yeah. yeah, um, you still don't expect it that that oh, young. No, exactly. I think we were all. It was just shock. Like that was the main thing to comprehend. That it was just like we hadn't even had the chance to accept that she was ill, really. Mm. And then when that all happened, it was just. You just don't re even know how to react, and everyone copes differently as well. Um, so I've seen you made a few posts about sort of grief and all that because you've yeah. you then experienced another one that was pretty kind of hard hitting in your life. Yeah. Um, the grief or the coping of grief during this period of time, mm -hmm. what did that look like for you? Was it sort of were you thrown back to the deep end of right, I need to get my shit figured out, I need to do that, and did that become <laughs> a distraction, or did you allow it yourself did. time? Yeah, so I was due to start the PT course in November and mum passed away in July. So a lot of people did say like, you know, just put it off, like just wait because you're not in a good place. I would have lost the plot if I didn't have that distraction and that direction. Because again, like the direction was something that I was looking for for so long. And it, it was so, I mean, I don't remember anything I learned in that time because I was, I was just on autopilot. I was just trying to survive. Mm. Um, but like my coping mechanism is keeping busy hundred percent. Like I was, I just function so much better when I'm busy, when there's that space to think too much about it all. I think I would have just, it wouldn't have been good for me. I think this is a, a hard concept for most people to grasp that 
everyone does have to deal with grief differently. Absolutely. You see what happened in the CrossFit games and stuff like that. Oh. So one of the athletes died in the event. Oh right? yeah, I did. So there's see all that, this actually. controversy around whether the event should go ahead or not. So a bunch of athletes pulled out, a bunch of them stuck in it. And from the outside looking in, you're like, how can you still continue with an event where someone's physically died in it? Um then they released a lot of them released the documentary and the money raised would go to the family of the yeah. the Lazar who passed away. But watching this this kind of hit home for me. I was like, well, actually, there's so many different ways to deal with grief because these guys were like, look, I'm, I'm not competing to get my best time, but this this is my way of coping. I need to be Absolutely. getting my heart rate elevated, doing or focusing on this one thing, yep. and this is going to allow me to, to cope with this. I had a guest on a couple of uh, months or so ago, um, and she lost her, her mum, and she was like, I don't know if I've really dealt with it, but when I've been competing in my high rocks races and that, it's just like, I found myself that's where I think about her the most. And I was like, well, when you think about it, that's your, that's your way of coping with it. Uh, so Absolutely. for you, like the autopilot part might have been that too. Yeah. Yeah. You can't judge people, you yeah. know, if I think some people feel guilty if they look like they're living life mm. after someone passes away. But if that is your way of coping, then, you know, it doesn't mean, and also like if you see someone, they look like they're fine. It doesn't mean they're fine either. No, you no. know, it's just like, they're smiling, eh? yeah, just cause they're on social media. Like it's just, <laughs> You don't, and it is something like showing that part of it as well is important, I think, about being honest about it and talking about it. Because a lot of people, I think when you're grieving, a lot of people, they don't want to kind of talk about it and they don't want to um, bring it up in case they upset you. And some people maybe don't want that, but I, I just knew from the moment it happened that I wanted to kind of create that safe space for people to ask questions, you know, because we all experience it at some point in our lives. and Yeah. It's a shame that people, the people that are going through it feel like it's like that kind of... Ooh, it's like wanna. a touchy subject. Yeah, it? and it just makes you feel more alone. Mm. Um, I think it's worth chatting to the person and asking, like, is this something you want to talk about? Like, creating a safe space to be like, talk about your person. Like, mm. I, I love, you know, if someone says, like, talk about your mum, let's have a chance to actually speak about her. Because mm. when people pass away people don't talk about them anymore and I just think it's such a shame because you know there's such a like my mom was such a massive personality and part of my life so I want to talk about about her as much as possible yeah. well she did definitely had a massive influence in where she going and yeah. I'm very positive that she'll be like yeah go on Kerry you're killing it now it's good yeah. to see you again. can't believe you're getting paid for it as well but well I done. know <laughs> she'll be like god you've got a bit too much self-belief now <laughs> calm down <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. Did you ever get any feelings of guilt or anything? Or like, it, I always kind of hear when people, someone close is to mm. someone close to them passes away, there's always like, oh, you know what? Like, this is where I realised I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. Mm. Does any of that come out for you? Is there anything that you can think of, or are you that you kind of cherish and kind of glad to the um, relationship you had? Well, I think the the fitness part is annoying that I didn't get into it sooner because oh. I'm like. Would I have been able to help in some way, you know, knowing what Team I up. know now? Yeah. Like something oh, with like your that. Actual, right, yeah, okay, with yeah, my yeah. mum, you know, like <clears throat> something like that, just being able to, to help her. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from that, not really. Does your mum or dad do anything with lifting weights or anything like that? So I took my mum to the gym a few times. That was good. I loved that. Um because there's a gym up there now, which is like blown my mind. <laughs> if there was a gym up there when I was younger, I Where would be massive gym? right now. Yeah, you'd <laughs> you yeah. be the bodybuilder that you're writing about. Yeah. yeah. What's the what was the closest gym growing up? Did you even know like what a gym setting was? Like, I know yeah, we did. We did get taken to a gym once. I think, like, got on the bus and off like we went. Big playground for you, like, oh, that's yeah. so cool. I was like, whoa. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was like a one off. Now yeah. there's way more stuff available up there but I, I didn't really go to a gym until I got to Edinburgh mm -hmm. uh that was the first time that I was like whoa they're everywhere mm. people are lifting weights for fun <laughs> I know like this is cool this yeah is cool. so you yeah. back to then like so as all of this is happening in life you eventually make the leap to start personal training and that mm -hmm. and you're building this relationship with John am I right in saying you see him every week for five years like yeah. consistently yeah so apart w when Covid hit mm. it, we did phone calls for a while and, and I never even thought of Covid actually I forget how yeah. much of a um, yeah. more loneliness that would have caused a big oh, chunk of massively that. yeah so yeah I was visiting him every week and, and in that time he, he was living at home and then Covid and then um 
he did then eventually go into hospital for a while and then into a care home after that, yeah. And that relationship as it's getting stronger, what was like the, like when you think back to like the memories with him, mm -hmm. what's like some of the best times that, that kind of stand out? I think like I loved when he used to talk about his wife. Mm -hmm. I just, I loved that so much because he, he met her through, he'd moved to Edinburgh and he had signed up to like, I think it's like Lonely Hearts, you know, in the paper. So it's like a dating. It's like Tinder, but. Yeah, exactly. The paper format. The, the old school, <laughs> yeah. So he signed up to that and he got matched up with like a few dates. Right. And he went on the first one and he was like, oh, I just didn't like her. He's like, I took her to the theatre and it's just, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, it was a great show, but I just didn't get on with her. Right. And then went on another date and didn't enjoy that either. And he was about to give up and then the woman got in touch and said no I, I have one more and I really think you're gonna like her and he it's crazy that there's a broker for relationships I know at this point. <laughs> I know and then he went on uh yeah I went and met Moira and he said that they just I think they were sitting in her car or yeah and they were chatting and he said I just didn't want to stop speaking to her no. I just want to speak and speak and speak so that's when I knew that um you know she was the one and I just always took that on I would remember that and just be like that's it's so lovely to think about that you know yeah. and how do you know how long they were together for in total or was it like their whole life I, I would think, imagine of some yeah sort? I think he was in his 40s right. when he moved to Edinburgh and then he was in his eight late 80s when she passed away mm. um so yeah whole life but they didn't have any children so that you know family wise they didn't have much family um so yeah that was and that creates this thing of when the other half passes away of like mm -hmm. who's who's kind of left for you. And this is a this is a hard kind of realization that I've seen with even some of the older clients I've trained. It's like death is around them so much at that mm -hmm. point, and that's why it's important to have like a bit of resilience around yeah. some sort of or some coping mechanism around grief. What do you think his came from? His resilience. Yeah, because it sounds like. I mean, because see, when you think about it, like how many, I would imagine you've came across quite a few of these types of people that, and it's this isn't kind of pointing the finger at all, but it's just like there's so much of their friends dying, their yeah. family members dying, that they're, they're so beat up from life. Mm -hmm. And it, it, can only, it can be extremely hard to go, right, but you're still alive. Come on, let's get up and yeah. keep, keep punching. And you hear of stories like John, and it's like, I, I wonder where that comes from. Yeah, his, like, yeah, his mindset, like his outlook I I think he had like he grew up you know his parents I think they were both dentists right okay um in the army I can't remember if his mum or his dad was but you know he went through a lot he moved around a lot um and I think it was just that those times they go through so much you know when you yeah. think about being alive when the when the war was on like that's yeah, crazy. You know, we can't even comprehend that um, being, you know, actually in amongst it is. Yeah. So I, I just think, I, I think he's always been like that. I got that impression that he was just always such a positive, lovely, you know, warm guy. And I think towards, yeah, in his later years when he did experience all of it, he just must have thought, you know, this is, this is what life is, is like now. And I need to just like keep going and he just kept making plans for the future there was never a point where he thought like well I'll maybe like calm down now and just what were some of the wildest plans that you've seen it you'd heard them sort of well it was his inventions that he was planning you know he had it in it he was so sure he was gonna create like this it was like a little mobility scooter that he could go around the house in and he was you know writing up the plans and everything and he you know he had a drive and a goal yeah, yeah. he was so in intelligent you know and for his birthday, like I remember, he was watching um, it was a countdown, and he said there was tapas came up. He's like, I want to try tapas, <laughs> <laughs> so we went out for tapas for his ninetieth birthday. Um, nice. Me and him and my sister, and it was just always things like that, you know. He was always just had this little spark that, you know, nothing would hold him back. Even by by that point, he was quite mobile at that point, but then um, he kind of lost his mobility a little bit not long after that. But still, he would say, right, I want to go to the theatre for my birthday. So we went to the theatre. Um, the the lack of mobility and stuff like that, what, what happened there? If you 
Don't mind me asking. Um, he just started to get ill. I think it was it was over the time of lockdown. Right. He started to get more ill and went into hospital. And then you know, it's what happens is mm-hmm. then going forward, if they're immobile for too long, yeah. and in hospital, and then your mind, you know, your mental health really you struggle with mm-hmm. that as well. So I think um a lot of that happened when he was in hospital, mm-hmm. and then went into the care home. And uh, what's that like for you? Kind of seeing this man on a week to week basis um, it's kind of f- fulfilling you and all this sort of stuff I'd imagine there would be a point and you're like okay this is, he's actually his health is deteriorating here and there could be a time where he goes pretty soon or was yeah. it, is it unexpected again um, no it was it was actually I don't know it was really weird when I would visit him he would the way he was talking it was almost like he knew mm. you know he, he started saying like Kerry I'm just so glad that I met you and just Things that he didn't really say, you know, he was, like I say, he was sentimental and he was very like that. But there was something just different in the, in the uh, maybe a few months before it happened. Um, and I was so lucky because I got a, a call from, there was kind of a few of us that would go visit him. There would be myself and his cleaner or who used to be his cleaner, uh, his hairdresser. So we were kind of in touch and I got a, a call saying that he had had a stroke. Um, but I just feel so lucky because I then got to go and sit with him, me and my sister. I drag my sister along everywhere, but she was a massive part of it as well. And we sat by his bed and played ABBA because, mm. you know, we would always play. He loved ABBA um, doing his exercise sessions. So we put that on and just sat with him. And he was he was there, but he, he didn't mm. quite know what was going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then he passed away the next morning. So just even being able to do that is such, such a privilege to be yeah. able to sit with somebody, you know, in those moments. Um, I think yeah. the massive thing to really look back on here is that last five years might not have been as long or whatever would have happened if it wasn't for charities like this and even yourself being in that position where yeah. you gave that time away. And I think that's what, that's why I'm fascinated about your your story and like where you're going with with your training and all. Because I'm like, yeah. man, that that hits like a real fulfilled part within me. It's like I want to get in about that because it is something that wants me. It makes me think like that's given back and it's like mm-hmm. there's no as no as I feel like oh I'm trying to edge my way into a well here. I'm trying to get financially compensated for this. It's like comes from a place of like I just want to help someone. I just want to give back from this this point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and striking the balance about like doing it full time as a career and then you know being able to live as well of course um, of course and that's that yeah. that's the hard part of it the whole i know how charitable can you be with with yeah. that? but there's different ways and and we'll come on to that yeah what, last thing can on john's part of the story mm-hmm. what, what was like some of the best advice you got from him someone being that old and wise i know he i think it was just mostly about all just always having hope you know just always being hopeful of what what you can do and he would say like when he was in the care home he would ask me to you know maybe go look for something that he had misplaced but he would say Carrie what I would do to be able to get up and just look in that cupboard right now by myself Mm. and that you know you just don't think about that or you say what I would give to be able to go out and run about and walk and drive and all these things you know he would Re- it's just that perspective you know we think oh I've got to get up and like do whatever did this make you aware of your mortality and your mm-hmm. uh, your kind of quality of life and the importance of health oh absolutely yeah. massively working with older people in general it does because everyone they've all got different abilities so it really kind of opens your eyes to the the different things people struggle with mm-hmm. you know that we take for granted it's like we all think like we've got ninety nine problems and stresses on our plate, but as soon as kind of our health's affected, there's only one that we care about at that yep. point, and it becomes the the driver of like yeah. fuck all that. Like mm-hmm. I just well, we need like I wish I I wish I'd done something with it, with us. Yeah. So the fitness side of things and starting to work with the kind of older population, do you get to do a bit of that with John then? Mm-hmm. Is that quite fun? Yeah. So he was the kind of ten more guinea reps. Pig. Come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He was like, you're meant to be here like, for a cup of tea and he's sweating his pan in. I know, <laughs> I know. He's like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> uh, yeah, we started doing, it was, it was more when he, 
he was in the care home mm. that we started doing those things um, and he had a physio go in which was quite good because I then kind of Give you, me that mentorship yeah, in the way yeah, like, of what to do. Using what they, and I felt more comfortable mm. doing that as well. I'd done my senior fitness qualification and all that stuff, but it still doesn't. Book smart stuff, isn't like, it? It's oh, like, great. I've yeah. got like a book that tells me, but this person in front of me, everyone's so different. So it was just a case of like seeing what he could do. And that's probably the biggest thing is like seeing what the person in front of you can do because you might, it might say, you know, written down, they shouldn't be doing this or they oh, should be doing this. Oh, you have to train to failure. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, hang on. Oh, hang on. We've got some other issues that we need to address. Yeah. So um, I just started trying things out and then that's when, like, I started putting music on and doing a bit of dancing as well. And I was like, God, dancing is just, yeah. it's just movement, but he's actually enjoying it. Yeah. So I had that as yeah. one of the, when I was kind of looking at it. So I've heard you, I, I think you said this before, it's like, um, I, the importance of actually playing music during your sessions because yeah. it's I forget like even from a generational impact the our kind of grands and grandpas and mm -hmm. uh, the older population music was a big factor of their social life ours is scrolling yeah. on our phone and looking at TikToks and stuff yeah. but for them it was it was songs and that brings back memories and all this sort of stuff oh, and I heard when I was I think I don't know if it was a story post or one of the posts that you put up or even just one of the classes I thought mm -hmm. I didn't even think about that of how powerful kind of music can be from them honestly when I have even today I I'll get them doing like resistance band exercises, but if a song comes on that they enjoy, it's like I'm torturing them, not <laughs> allowing them to dance. Yeah. You know, they'll have the band wrapped around their legs and they're like, like just to wanting to get up. Yeah, it's, it's, I think one of the most important parts of the classes is the music mm. because it's when you're sitting there in silence and they're doing these exercises, which, you know, I try and, I try and help them understand why they're doing them. I don't say we're going to do bicep curls because they're like, what is that? And why do I need to do them? You know, it, it has to be kind of transferable to everyday life. So I'll say, you know, you're going to get up out of a chair because you want to be able to do that forever. Mm. It's really important. Um, but without the music, like the music just adds so much to it. Mm. They absolutely love it. And I've just, I've got a playlist um, that, you know, I just build on. I ask them all, like, right, tell me what's your favourite song. I can imagine songs. like, Rihanna guys, like, <laughs> yeah. no, no, all right, okay. <laughs> They're like, absolutely not. Um, and yeah, they just... They just absolutely love the the music aspect to it, yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's talk about the kind of journey of that for you then. So where when does all this all happen? This happens how many years ago? Like from kind of John or you doing your own thing? You start to pursue your journey of personal training? Yeah, so I, I started uh, 2020 and then I was working in the gym for a couple of years Oh, so you so you start and then it's like okay this is what I'm doing and then it's like boom yeah. everything shuts and you're like oh yeah yeah I was <laughs> just getting here? into it. I'm like oh this is actually I'm quite a good personal trainer I'm like you know mm -hmm. getting the reps in and then they were like yeah we're closing down in a week I was like what <laughs> so what do you do at this point because you're if you have this lack of self belief in you and there's a passion that's fueling you a little bit yeah. you're like oh, what do I do now were you able to still do video sessions and all that or did you kind of um so it yeah it was very short notice which was really unfortunate and I did I'd built up I was just in that transition between like moving away from working in the gym I was like okay I'm not gonna be like yeah. cleaning the treadmills anymore yeah. this is it uh, and I was so excited about it so I built up a client base I had about 15 clients um which was great and then it closed and I was like, I've got these people with nowhere to go. It was really, I just, I remember. And again, this is another example of like, you know, when you kind of thrive in adversity. I woke up at 5 a.m. the next morning and I was like, I'm going to find a gym today for all my clients. I'm not leaving them in the lurch. I want to make sure that they're going to continue training and there's not going to be any gap. Um, so I just went around Edinburgh looking for places and I found like a wee place and I thought this is, it's, it was great, but it just didn't quite fit. I wanted somewhere that my clients could join as well and mm -hmm. be quite comfortable in. Um, so that's then when I found Banatines and I decided that um, I would go there for, for however long. Uh, so your gym closed, did it close because of, like as a byproduct because of COVID or did it just close just? Um, yeah, it was just, just, they just said it wasn't a, a viable yeah. business anymore. Um, it's but such a hard market. It's why, one of the reasons yeah. I never ran this as an open gym, because I, kind of, when you do the numbers and the math and what it takes, it's like, you kind of need a lot of staff and a lot of management. Yeah. And it's like, that takes you away from what you want to do. And it's, 
I always say like gyms are like it's like it gives us the ability to train and help impact people's lives but running a gym is you, you're caring about that member number and the money yep. coming in to keep the place afloat exactly. and it kind of takes you away from what you're yeah you're do. so far removed but it was actually so I still work for that same company they said you know we, we still want to keep people on for the community outreach stuff mm-hmm. um so they actually allowed me then to you know yeah. get, get into retirement homes and and uh, sheltered housing Brilliant. and stuff good so it was actually a bit of a blessing yeah. for me to be honest so this allows you to get into the market that you want to get into or did yeah. you not really know like, like what's the like where are you getting torn between yeah I think at that point I just I was a bit stuck like I was stuck in just PTing mm. and you know working in the business not thinking like right where is this going because I still want to do the senior stuff but I got to the point where I I, I just didn't quite have the confidence I needed mm. to or I didn't even need it I just needed to push myself to do it but I thought, no, I could just be a bit better working with anyone. I need a bit more experience before I go and take the leap. And I just didn't know how that looked either. So that was actually the catalyst then when they said about doing the community outreach stuff that I, I then thought, oh, my God, I'm actually going to do a senior class. I'm going to have to do that now. Mm-hmm. And did you get, was, were you able to get like some sort of paid position with this? I know it's, yeah, not, it's not like yeah. great. I think... Um, one of the guys that used this uh, place before, he'd done a bit of it um, where he was brought in through, I don't know if it's the NHS or the, mm-hmm. maybe they do something similar. Yeah. But he went around different um, care homes and stuff like that. Um, and I always wondered, like, I was like, oh, that seems pretty cool. And I was like, but I don't want paid for it. I would do my own thing with it. So I, I, I then can have the control over what you do. Yeah. Did you feel, did you have any sort of control or did you have to kind of fit? A model like for example if you do classes in the gym it's like mm-hmm. if there's legs bums and tums you need to do legs bums and tums whereas i would rather yeah. like guys let's just deadlift and let's see what we do no they didn't honestly Maybe i just came night. up with it myself all of it it was it's so good like that i've got so much freedom with it mm-hmm. um so which is good and bad because i went in i was like i don't know what to do <laughs> i've got these textbooks but when you get in there it's so different Bulgarian split squat guy oh you can't yeah. stand up all right, right. okay oh, what do I do great. Now? <laughs> and then you go in and, and you've got somebody who is partially sighted somebody who's deaf mm-hmm. you've got a class full of people that have completely different needs how big was the first class I think the first one was only like five I mean ten's the limit ten yeah. ten's the max anyway was it intimidating first one was five. Oh, I was so intimidated so what had you done like classes me? before like that I know, yeah, in the in the gym, I done. That's quite intimidating as well. It is. You're like, oh, <laughs> I know I'm meant to be the fitness expert here, but I'm quite nervous. I know, <laughs> yeah. That's that was the number one thing I was nervous about: starting in a gym, st- standing up in front of everyone and and doing it. It's like a performance. I know. It? Yeah. <laughs> it's like your center stage, and everyone's looking at yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, then doing it for for the seniors, I was like, oh god, what if they just don't like me? And also, what if they think like, what is she talking about? She doesn't know what it's like. You know, to be older. Yeah. Um, it's one thing I've always thought about, like, how can I communicate this effectively to my older clients that I know I'm saying this to mm-hmm. better the quality of life. And I know you guys are like, oh, but you're only 30. Like, come on. Like, yeah. Like, what do you know? But it's like it, the, the thing that you'll have now is proof and confidence that yeah. you've done a little bit of this with other people and you've seen the positive impact that it can have. So you can draw to that. Uh, but starting out, you're like, here, <laughs> I don't know. Like it might yeah. put in an early grave. We, do, we, we don't yeah. know what's going to happen. Who knows? Here. Let's just like try, try it out. I th- like honestly, the main thing is that you show that you care. Like I was just about to say, I bet you the feeling was not nothing to do with the class, mm-hmm. but more that you were there and you created an environment for them to have fun. Yeah, and that you can show that you want to be there because that's other things I've heard is they've you know they've all been to classes before and they said yeah it was okay but the the person didn't really look like they wanted to be there and I think you know every personal trainer every fitness instructor has their own thing that they're passionate about and if that's not your thing then I wouldn't recommend doing it because your clients can sense it Mm -hmm. um so them just knowing that you care and getting to know them on an individual basis is is so so important so you understand like which ear is their good ear for you to speak into <laughs> and uh, you know what you can do to adapt it so they don't feel left out if you're playing a game where if someone's partially sighted and you're trying to throw something into a circle you know like I know if I'm standing there that 
you know, Kathy can see me or she can at least kind of get an idea of where the circle is. So it's like these little things that you can only learn by spending time with them and, and interacting with them, you know, and like getting yeah. to know them. How much do you see yourself being very similar to your mum in these sort of environments? Yeah, I, I do see myself being very similar. Like Even now. Though, like the banter and all that. So yeah. Like, I'm used to do that. That's it. It's like having that humour in, in a situation where, you know, people maybe, what, exercising is intimidating for anyone, I think. Like, um, so when people come in and they're really nervous, just having that banter, having that bit of humour and everyone taking the piss out of each other is great and that's what my mum used to do you know it was just like it didn't matter if she was going in to you know bath them or something she would you know make jokes about yeah. whatever it was that that you know would make yeah, them laugh appreciate that. They appreciate you said it. something earlier on that i would imagine the kind of senior population feel as well it's like well we need to be very fragile around you we need to kind of care we don't want to like dive deeper into it because you might be i don't know you, you don't want to upset them yeah but a lot of them will probably crave in that attention because it, it can be so lonesome oh absolutely like we do there's this idea that everything needs to be gentle and easy mm. and i just think it's doing them a disservice Absolutely. if they don't understand that they need to challenge themselves when it comes to exercise then they're not going to be, yep. be pushing themselves and of course i'm never like when someone walks in and they say i'm you know i've just I want to be here and I feel okay, but I'm really not in the mood. I'm not going to say, well, you need to push yourself. Otherwise it's not worth it. It's about how you frame it to people. But I just think like we often forget that these older people, they've had a life. They're, you know, they're adults. They're not, you don't need to speak to them like they're children. And I find that people often fall into that. Yeah. So. That's the same in the caring world though as yeah. well. Yeah. Like you do, I don't want to say jobs work because I imagine everyone's got the right intention, but it's maybe just how the craft, how they've been crafted as an individual, has kind of led them to a couple of bad experiences and then writing everyone off with the with the same thing. Yeah. So I want to talk about like misconceptions. Oh yeah. So what's what have you kind of found that some of the most common misconceptions are with, uh, especially as we age? Because I, I love this conversation and I think I hate I hate it. it's like oh you. You wait till you get to my age and wait to this and it's such a frustrating phrase to hear. Yeah. I understand it. I've got a lot of compassion mm -hmm. and a wee bit of empathy towards because we're maybe a wee bit more well informed these days. But what's some of the things that come out that you've found uh, with maybe even tell us some of the stories that you found with cognitive awareness and ability for some of the guys that you've. Yeah, been kinda seen? I mean, the main thing is that people accept that their mind and their body is going to deteriorate as they age. And that just. It do, not not to the degree that people think it's going to happen, you know, like it's like they just accept it. Mm. Um, and a lot of the people that I work with, they're determined that that's not going to happen. You know, they're just keeping going. They're keeping active and um, keeping their mind and their body active. So that kind of idea that because you're older just means that everything's downhill. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, it does not need to be like that. And I keep pushing that message. It's hard. It's hard when you're not older. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, you just don't get it. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I've got proof. I've got these people. They've mm -hmm. got, a you know, a man in, who's 98, turning 99, you know, soon, who is so fit. Mm -hmm. He still cycles about, which is, does give me the fear a wee bit, but <laughs> still cycles about Edinburgh. Um, because he's determined that he he's going to stay fit. What do you think the characteristics of those people? Do you think do you ever need to, not force, but feel that you're having to like how do you how do you cast the net a little bit wider to inspire some some more of the kind of older population to come through that? How big is the care homes that you're going into? Um, so these are retirement homes, so well, they're sheltered homes, house. Yeah, 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 so it's like someone described it as like halls of residence for older people. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. that's actually yeah. really accurate. <laughs> um, so I mean, the classes themselves are usually only about eight or nine people. Mm. Um, but again, it's been the same people for yeah. ages. No one, you know, it's so hard to to get people to to come out of there. And these are in the in the sheltered housing, so it's you know, it's not far for them to go. But that, that's not the point. The point is it's intimidating for them. Yeah, and they're also scared of, because what, I guess, what's happening to people around them? Yeah. The, the following, 
the, the statistics of someone yep. falling and I think it's a 50-50 chance that they'll die over the age of 70. Yep. Mm-hmm. That, like hearing that and it's like, okay, I'm going to stand up and do this so-called fitness thing. Absolutely exactly. no chance. I'm not going to put myself out there at that risk. But yeah. easy life creates a hard or easy mm-hmm. uh, kind of creates this harder lifestyle and quality of life will drop if you're, yeah. if you're not doing things. Yeah, and it's like, because once you get older, you know, some people accept that you might need a bit of support and a bit of help from a carer or something. But it's it. I see it as my job to help them understand that if, if someone's doing something for them, they're going to lose the ability to do it themselves if they're not doing it. They And that's why when we're doing the classes and they're doing like maybe a, a shoulder press or something like that, I'm saying like if you're lifting something, if you're putting something in the top shelf of a cupboard or if you're picking up the kettle, like, these are all things that you want to be able to do. You don't want someone doing them for you. It's nice, you know, every now and again, but this is why we're doing these exercises. And the confidence aspect as well is like, I say to them, like, you can't, you absolutely, you walked in here, you sat down and you've gotten up and you've done, so you can do this, just do it at your own pace. You know, don't think about what, what Bob's doing because this is your own, you know, your own wee journey that you're gonna that you're on um so you know and we keep note of what everyone does if we do like a sit to stand we do it to time as well to make sure that people aren't just trying to do 10 repetitions it doesn't matter you just do how many you can we'll note them down you know I'll go around and ask them so they don't have to shout it out because they're <laughs> still they're a bit like well I did you know five and he did seven what the hell so I make sure that it's just them focusing on themselves yeah. and progressing. that's the hard thing about the group stuff isn't that everyone's always looking <laughs> Uh, yeah pushing the I've, i do it with the workshops with the guys i've got just now and i was like you are putting your own numbers in your your program yep. yes we're all doing the same exercise but there's no we're no pushing we're not comparing each other to each other it's like you're comparing you to you and i start and i'll go for two more and it's like no form is dog shit let's keep this yeah keep this where it's at and then yeah we'll next week we can try for an extra rep because you're already winning because you've done a little bit longer than last time exactly time. what's yeah. the the in that world then are you finding those who've came to the the classes mm-hmm. have gone away and spoke to someone and brought someone else in. Is that yeah. happened at all? Yeah, that has happened. So someone brought their sister in and then there's been, yeah, just a few a few people that have said like and I'm so lucky. They sing they do sing my praises. They're like, you know, my best marketing. Um for good reason though. <laughs> yeah, think, uh, well, yeah. Like you, you compare it to like hearing of what you hear with mm-hmm. some of them going to it's like it's all driven by the person leading it as well. Mm. So yeah, you might have a good group of people, but you're kind of creating that space as well. So you need to give yourself yeah, a bit more. Yeah, I know. The back. <laughs> I do. I just yeah, they 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 do definitely like say when I go in, it's so nice when they're like, oh, you're Carrie, you're the the fitness uh, <laughs> instructor, and it's nice when you know that they've been talking about it and that they're enjoying it because exercise for older people like I, you know it's like when we get older you can be like oh Dale remember when this is like when you were deadlifting remember yeah. that's not they don't remember that because they didn't do it mm. gyms are it's such a, a new, new thing yeah. that they're not going to think back to when they enjoyed exercise because they never did mm. probably that's what I was saying to you earlier I don't know if we said it on the podcast or not but it seems like we are grown up in this world where more and more people will probably most likely will have experienced a gym yeah. by the older they get but we're sort of writing off a generation that even like my mum and dad's generation actually if I think about it the gym was the bodybuilding place it wasn't yep. the to have a longer quality of life for your health and fitness it was this is where bodybuilders go and that's it sometimes power lifters made their way in yeah but that's all it was really about exactly and everything else to do with fitness was about losing weight fat loss diets, that was it and that was it that was yeah. it sort of what it's been branded as yeah and try to push back and that message can be very frustrating at times mm-hmm. so you mentioned market and then obviously within all this yes you might be able to get like get a uh, payment for doing these types of classes mm-hmm. but it's not as if it's going to be the main breadwinner of your no. personal training type of thing mm-hmm. so how has this helped your personal training as a business as, or do you feel you're torn um well it's definitely helped because i get a lot of inquiries from people just saying i see what you do with yeah, the right. older people and i think you know just i can see that you you know are open to helping anyone and the style of exercises you do would suit me so it's definitely helped good um, but it is a difficult one because it's some. It is a direction I want to go more in, mm-hmm. but it's about figuring out how I can make that work. Mm-hmm. 
you know. So in terms of what, like just doing more with? Yeah, I think just because right now it's just I, I'm doing one more one to one in the gym and, you know, a few classes. I am kind of starting more classes as well figuring out like logistically how that would work as well going around different places or if I would just start taking more older people into the gym mm -hmm. um so it's at that stage now where I'm kind of putting feelers out to see what is available and you know funding wise if that would because another thing the money side of it is like they're not used to the seniors are not used to investing in themselves in that way mm -hmm. um it was like protect it and pass it down to the, the families yeah. and kind of use it for themselves exactly so that's the thing you know like marketing towards um child their children or their you know grandchildren or something like that is allowing them to see how it would benefit them but you know i just i don't want the cost to fall on on them at all mm. like i would love it to just be through funding and for me to be able to do it and um without that part of it yeah but that's, that's just thing, like an, in like, an ideal world. I'm like, I'll just do it for free, yeah. please. Have you thought like, so what would like the future hold for you in an ideal world? What would you, what would you sort of love for that to look like? I think like, I think having a team of people and getting them to go out to different retirement homes, mm -hmm. care homes, having a team of people that I trust, you know, there's personal trainers that I've met um, through kind of my journey so far that I, I think would be amazing at that. Um, and just knowing that you would put them out to, to a, a care yeah. home and, and they would deliver, you know, an amazing experience for the residents. So I think it would be something like that. I've considered getting my own space as well, something, but there's just so much to it. Yeah. And as you say, like, it does take you away from what you got into it for. So it would have to be a case of, like, having someone run the gym that's not me because I don't think that's what I want to do. Um, but I think at this point it would be more just having people that would go out and, and making sure I'm still doing the classes, but just being able to help more people. Yeah, it's a wider scale. Yeah. I think it's a weird realisation that you never thought would be a problem. It's like, oh, it would just be nice to help people. And you're like, oh, help more people. So how do help more people? <laughs> I know, it's so difficult. And like with the whole online space taking off right now, like that's not to say that I can't do some of that as well with the older people. You know, having... Um, advice there having videos there that that they because a lot of people are using i get messages from you know the the norton athletes like in their 80s saying sorry we'll i can't so, make it in yeah. whatsapp like, okay voice noting and all <laughs> <Yeah>. that next <laughs> like come again today not feeling well yeah like and uh, uh, there's definitely technical technological uh challenges with older mm -hmm. clients but they can learn like i've absolutely i've taught some of my friends mums and dads that have been training me i think they were in their late 60s even jill's mum uh, she was 65 i got her doing downloaded the app and she was following her program in the house and i was like good she's following her mobility drills and all yeah. that sort of stuff so like just going oh okay we won't we'll just even if you had to print it out for them like I'm absolutely sure there's always a way and everyone's so different mm -hmm. so yeah what would the so the what's the space like from what you see because you're in that world what if you had to kind of wave a magic wand what would you do more of or what would you have more of other than just more people reaching out to care homes or or uh, sorry retirement homes what's like some of the challenges in the space that you're like man i wish we could just get rid of this red tape um i would say like there's just see the qualifications right the amount that like, you feel like you're never qualified enough to to help older people all ah, right okay. so um you know there's just so many and a lot of them i'm not putting them down but uh, you know it's money making i think a lot of these ticking the box yeah ticking a box so i just feel like maybe that and i've always wondered why more people aren't doing going into senior fitness ah. but i just think there's just a lot of um requirements they're like you can't do this unless you have this this and this yeah. What is some of them then? Because I must, I guess this might be one of the benefits of having your own place. You can skip <laughs> yeah. some of the, maybe the legal yeah. requirements to do some things. So like um, long-term conditions mm -hmm. is one, you know, that I got um, not that long ago. And it is really good because, you know, there's so many people with long-term conditions that we work with as PTs. Mm -hmm. um, GP referral, I so think. So I managed to get that one when I done yeah. mine. But again, the, you go through all the... I think uh, most common drugs, mm -hmm. what a headache that was. It's oh, like, I know. I'm never going to remember this. Yeah. But I tell you what I do remember when I've got a client in front of me and they tell me they've got X and I'm like, right, okay, I need to look that up. Yeah. Now. And I'm like, I've okay, got a book. Now, <laughs> I, I now know what that is. Yeah. 
So yeah, uh, that's so a, I forgot about that one actually. Um, so is that the common ones then? And are you ever in contact with GPs other than the physios that come on site, um, or does it not really? Go not that at far? the moment. I have had one of the the members of of one of the classes say that he put me in he would put me in touch with one of his yeah. nurses because she said like this is something you know and it, it, it like I would te- definitely be open to doing stuff yeah. like that. Um, People ever push back on creating resistance for the the senior classes. Do you mean the seniors? Like it's like, oh, they shouldn't be doing that sort of stuff or? Um, not really, to be honest. I think because when you build up trust and that you kind of show them that you know what you're talking about and that you care about them individually, then they're open to doing it. But see if there is somebody who comes in and says, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing that today. I'm not going to convince them Mm. because I know when we start dancing, they'll start dancing. That's enough. You know, Mm. there was like a woman today who's came in and she said, look, I don't, I'm not really wanting to do anything. I just want to sit and watch. And that's enough. That's so powerful in itself. Like I think that the ability and the quality of life that these guys and uh, girls have at the older age, it's not, yes, there's a physical element, but there's also the mental element that we just sort of just forget about. And yeah. I can't imagine what that loneliness feels like. Exactly. Just them coming out of their house and sitting and maybe laughing at something that I've done or someone's done. Like, that's so valuable in and of itself. Do you think COVID made that, like, worse for people? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for all of us, you know, it did. It impacted everyone's confidence. The smallest, like, social plan became this massive thing. You're like, whoa, mm. I can't go outside today, mm-hmm. you know. And, and for older people, if you imagine how how amplified that was for them when going outside. Because they were targeted. Yeah. It's like you have a higher risk of dying if you exactly. go Exactly. <laughs> if they didn't think they were vulnerable before, then them being like, like, it was just so, you know, mm. um... It was a massive thing to be told that they were they were part of you know that vulnerable population, and then again back to like gentle exercise, easy. You need to be looked after. You need to. It's like no, you need to be made to be resilient, mm-hmm. and that is through resistance. challenging yourself and resistance. Yeah. So uh, one thing I never touched on, but I think you mentioned it on uh, the previous podcast, the whole uh, idea of what are you doing in these pl- these sort of classes? It's sort of. Mm-hmm. It's, mo- it's looking at the movement patterns. So you mentioned yep. like reaching above head and all yep. the daily movement patterns that you do. Um, I've always said from the get-go that every single person, regardless of your age, should own a resistance band. I think it's such a powerful yeah. tool. But we sort of, especially the younger guys, and guys in particular, they kind of scoff. It's like, I can lift weights in the gym. I don't need that. Yeah. And it was lockdown that I started doing some resistance exercise. Oh, really? And I was like, ah. well, man, I was like... My back's got pump. My yeah, arms look yeah. bigger. Like, what the hell is going on? That's uh, it. And very, very fascinating. But I always get challenges, usually from uh, it's like the bodybuilding side of the community. It's like, no, you can't grow muscle through that. It's like you'd be surprised what you can do with Absolutely. resistance. Absolutely, resistance is relative. Yeah, resistance is resist. Like it does, your body doesn't know what you're doing, and if mm. you're pushing it hard enough, yeah, obviously a band is not gonna. You know, you, it, there is there are limitations, but. You know, as long as you, it's as hard as you make it, mm-hmm. you know. And I just think that there's always a place for a resistance band and everyone's. I think back. when, <laughs> so see if you think about the whole retirement side of things, you get this pension of yeah. money that comes in. I think it should be a wee care package and it should be, here's your daily mobility d- drills that yeah. you should try and do. And then here's a wee, here's a wee resistance band to kind of keep you going. Yeah, I love it. that. Yeah, absolutely. What's your favourite go-to sort of moves in the, and that's, world so bent over row yeah. like seated row yeah absolutely everyone's just i it amazes me how like how good their form is <laughs> you know when i'm doing something i'm like you maybe just sit up you don't need to worry about hinging forward and they're like hinging forward perfectly doing <laughs> like, it what's going on i'm yeah. like oh my god this is amazing yeah. um pull apart another one i mean they're hard they are hard for anyone but they're all they smash them mm. Um, and then sit to stand will always be the number one. And I'm yeah, like, if you do to. any exercise, if you only do one, just do a sit to stand. And it, it explain that for the guys listening. I'm assuming it's just like on using a chair. Yeah, yeah. Up. It's just sitting down. It's like a squat without a chair. Mm-hmm. You know, a squat with a chair even. Um, and 
of course it's what they do every day mm -hmm. so you can do it like staggered stance so it's more like if you were actually getting in and out of a chair mm -hmm. um or do it with your feet you know just about hip width apart um and just doing that and i I usually do say thir put 30 seconds on the clock and just get them to do as many as they can with good form and not rushing Aye, their own their own pace <laughs> their own yeah. pace note it down and just see if they can is there any competitiveness in the in oh that, yeah. yeah so i see you do the games at the end and all of yeah. that always oh, some of the favorite games that you do um well they love like throwing the the pilates ball they love like throwing the bean bags and this is something as well that i've noticed um is so many of them the, the ones i've seen that have come in really you know lacking confidence unsure um, and even their mobility, you know, they'll come in maybe like shuffling Stiffing, yeah. and um, and I'll be really careful with them. And then as soon as I introduce some sort of game or I put a ball in their hands, something sparks, like a little spark in them. That it must just be back to like school or if they did play a, a sport. Just sent, uh, probably central nervous system, just yeah. loosening up a little bit. And they come to life Aye. and they get so competitive and I think that's why the different aspects of the classes are so important because if I had just done the mobility stuff or just done the resistance stuff, I would have never seen that part. So each person has like the bits that they enjoy the most. So I think it's important to have all of those different components mm -hmm. so that they can, uh, yeah, just have that little moment where like, this is my time. Has <laughs> there ever been like any mistakes that you've made with kind of the class stuff? Um... And the reason I asked this question is I started a mobility class in the gym I used to work in. Mm -hmm. I was like, I ain't doing, sp oh, I've done, spin, done a bit of spin, but I was like, I'm not doing this body pump. I was like, let me, if you want classes on, let me put on a mobility one. And then I'd done it and I made it so freaking intense that midway through I was like, okay, this is this is a bit much, but this part and parcel of the game. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it was like not doing, I think I ended up putting like five different drills for the hips and even mine, because I was going through it with them. I was like, yeah. oh, for that? feeling this like my lower back is yeah <laughs> like, and I, i've kind of invited like, this is quite tame yeah. and all this sort of stuff yeah and I was like, this is not tame like, i'm trying to think i don't think anything with that i think with the dances if i've learned now if you do make them too complicated there are like certain people that just get so frustrated that they think like why can't i do ah, this right, okay so now I've kind of like just told them that it doesn't matter what you're doing. Like it's just <laughs> chaos anyway. Like let's just embrace it. But there are certain people that I know do get frustrated with themselves. And it's almost like that balance between if it's too easy and they still can't get it, they still get really frustrated. So I try and make it a kind of in between where there's always a little bit of like, you can just go rogue, just play an instrument, any instrument, you know, like air bagpipes, that's fine. Um, so there's a part that they're like, well, it doesn't matter what I'm doing now. And then we go back to maybe doing something where they use a bit more of their, yeah. you know, coordination and memory. Um, so it's definitely like you have to be quite tactical with it mm -hmm. to keep them motivated and engaged. Yeah. And that's part, I think that comes with experience as well, though. Like yeah. you've, you've now picked that up on. Yeah. What's like the best advice you've kind of received or you've seen in that world just with the group stuff as opposed to you also mentioned about John and yeah. uh, his outlook towards life but is there anything from like these little wholehearted stories from dealing with them um the I mean Sorry. so there's another John mm -hmm. John um who's at Mobile Mondays and he you know he still goes out and goes dancing till all hours and He's just oh, he's just always says like I'll I'll never stop dancing. I just keep he keeps he's writing a book. He's ninety four and he's Gosh. writing a book. <laughs> I get drafts in an email. I'll be like, this is a chapter. I don't <laughs> I don't really understand it. It's a bit beyond me. But um, it, it is about just keep doing what you enjoy doing. Don't stop. Don't give up on it. You know, if you enjoy singing and dancing, just keep doing that in any way that you can. Um. And that's what they all say. They've all got their little things, you know. I've got one guy who's obsessed with the giraffes, and you know he's always just going and seeing them at the zoo, and then that's what like, he loves, though. and he loves it. And we are, and I try and make that part of the class as well. He was like, "Hey, you talk too much about giraffes. That's my thing. Can you stop?" <laughs> I got a like a little toy from one of my clients of a giraffe for my birthday, yeah. and he was like, "That's not even your thing." I was <laughs> like, like, "I've talked about it so much now." <laughs> But it is about like again. I think it comes down to like getting to know them. But once you know, like all these little things, then 
do you ever get like overwhelmed or like, have your own down days from helping so many other people and kind of reflecting mm-hmm. on your own where you're at with your own journey oh absolutely yeah I think it's you know you can tell people these things and give them advice day in day out and then to take on yourself is really hard um sometimes because you never feel like you're doing enough you know and you're trying to keep on top of your own training and then um on top of all the business side of things so yeah I definitely have days where I get and it's a bit of burnout as well I think that's quite natural with being a PT actually not that long ago felt pretty burnt out but that's when it came back to me looking at my life and thinking what of the pillars am I not nailing up in the end. and it's sleep usually because yeah. you're getting up so early and I think I love the idea of getting up at the crack of dawn and being finished early but what they don't tell you is you're knackered <laughs> by the time like 2 p.m 3 p.m rolls around you're so tired um so then it's again looking at my schedule and being like okay what actually what needs to change I need to get better at sleeping more mm-hmm. um, and reducing stress and, you know, realising you're doing your best. Uh, of course. I think that's the always wanting more and chasing more or trying to do more because yeah. the vision and the dream is maybe so powerful to, like, I, don't, I want to help these people. Yeah. It's like, okay, I need to keep doing that. But it does lead to this, like, crash as well. And it's like, right, yeah. how, can I, how can I reflect? What does your kind of weekly routine look like? Or what do you do to cope with the burnout side of things, like, personally? So, I mean, it's just about keeping keeping that routine there. I sleep, honestly, I've been banging on about it so much because it, it's the one thing that impacts everything mm-hmm. because it's that domino effect. Yeah. You're not sleeping well, then you're not, you know, preparing. I need to meal prep because I'm just so busy, so then I don't meal prep and then meal deals. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That, like, even cravings for me, I notice if sleep isn't yeah. sort of in the same range or very consistent, I'm like... I'm so hungry today, but I'm not hungry for the normal yeah. food. It's like, I want five Kinder Buenos. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, like, where's all that coming from? I had a day there where I didn't sleep very well. And then I went to Mobile Mondays and it was someone's birthday. And yeah. I brought in like a Victoria sponge chocolate cake. And that's all I ate. I just did, yeah. And I was like, up. this is like the <laughs> dark side of training seniors yeah. is you eat so many biscuits <laughs> and cakes. Um, the, I had, um, so sometimes, uh, not sometimes, with guests that I bring on, I normally do like a like a this or that or an overrated underrated yeah so i wrote down a few things for you um i'm very curious to see like if you had to kind of only pick one so this or that okay what i've got here is resistance bands or weights or free weights what would you go with for the rest of your life oh resistance bands resistance bands oh yeah. definitely now i know you're a bit of coffee snob with uh, the shops and all that are you have i kind of made that up mm, your stories can i say like, otherwise <laughs> i love coffee shops right I'm not a coffee snob. All right, so it's the shops. And I, lo- right. I love a wee Nest Cafe. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the coffee, I had the coffee question here with Starbucks or Costa. Oh. Controversial, mm-hmm. yeah. I actually prefer Costa coffee. Oh, do you? I go to Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Starbucks, I think it's got a nicer environment. Yeah. I think it's got a nicer coffee, but. Really? Yeah, yeah. I have a Costa sometimes. I'm like, eh. Yeah. Starbucks, I'm like. Starbucks, the Starbucks here is quite nice. It's just, it's been built in the last oh, year. Right. Give it an R year and it'll be but your dress standards. Yeah, as coffee, sh- <laughs> coffee shop of the day, uh, I can't, I can't answer either of those because independent so what, coffee shops. Yeah, yeah, support. Them. Needs to be that. What's been your favourite coffee shop you've been to? What's up there? Well, that's a difficult one. I do, there's one not far from the gym that I'm at called the Bastard Barista. Mm. And the coffee nice. is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. I like I it. recommend it. <laughs> so, uh, squats or deadlifts? hard one for me you could dance with this both for you and for, for training the seniors <laughs> <laughs> um i would say deadlifts really that's a really hard one to be honest because for me i don't deadlift that much anymore how come um i don't know i just moved away from it my own training i did used to do more powerlifting style training and then I just moved away from it a bit more and I'm just starting to get more into doing back squats again um but yeah that's a really no now I'm (laughs) doubting it I'm gonna say squats yeah yeah I I was enjoying squats a lot for the first time in a very long time Mm -hmm. um I think my training kind of took a hit and this is a whole other story but like after I got covid um I wasn't that well for quite a long time okay 
And my training absolutely suffered. Mm. And then they were like, oh, maybe it's long COVID. I think a lot of people are going through this right now. Mm. Of like, there's something not quite right, but we're not sure. And so the thought of squatting or deadlifting, oh my God, it was uh, just like, I couldn't even. There's so much of it. And then you've maybe tied a lot of your um, your past experience to that. So it's like you go into the gym and it's like, yeah. am I really want to just go back to the bar or back to the 30 yeah. or whatever weight it is before? Oh, yeah. And it's like, it's not a whole humbling experience oh. to try and go through again yeah that's it you're squatting like mm. half of what you did before and it's feeling like like your one rep max it is so demoralizing yeah. but i'm like think about what you're saying to clients it doesn't matter don't worry about the numbers so i always like to know like where people's fitness goals are at um so usually i can ask questions around that doing the bodybuilding kind of um dissertation did you ever have like visions of yourself going down that route of a more aesthetic route yeah, I actually did. At that point, I did. Um, I always thought that would be great to, you know, to push yourself to that point and be that disciplined. Mm -hmm. But then as I actually got into personal training, I realized that I I just didn't want to do that mm -hmm. to myself. Probably didn't have the discipline either, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the route I wanted to go down at all. I wanted to go down more the performance side of things. Not to say that I did anything <laughs> for that either. So what did you do? Um but I just thought, you know what, I'd rather, you know, bodybuilding was something that I was really interested in as well, you know, like building muscle and then going through a bit of a cut and, and all of that. Like, that's cool. And I still think that's really cool. But actually, to the point of competing, definitely don't have that in me. Did you see, so I, I think this is an interesting conversation with um, female bodybuilders and yep. actual detrimental impact to mm -hmm. hormones and all this sort yep. of stuff. Doing your dissertation, did that kind of, did you dive into that sort of stuff or did you know, was it more? Cycle? It was more identity based. So it was yeah. more kind of like, yeah, how how they saw themselves and how other people saw them them when they had built muscle. So yeah. we didn't really dive too much into that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's such a difficult one because your body is, is, it looks in great condition, but what, you know, what are the implications mm. of it? This is the hard thing to fight against with, I think with your message in particular, but I'm very similar as well. It's like, yeah, fat loss is one little piece of the puzzle, but if we focus on moving better, feeling better, then that'll have this bigger impact on your yeah. fat loss journey. Exactly. How's your body image with yourself? Has that been pretty decent? Over, um, or did you? Yeah, actually. I was always like naturally very slim growing up. Um, and so I just got in my head I wanted to just build muscle as much muscle as I could you know I was like Project. I just want to yeah <laughs> I'm still still on that journey I'm still very <laughs> slim but um, yeah I just I think it's like you always want what you don't have isn't it and like looking back at pictures I just looked I was I was really really slim and I just wanted to build muscle and that's something like working with my one-to-one -one clients um, I love it you know when I get people coming to me that are just like I just want to put on yeah. muscle mm. you know I don't want to think about it. I don't I don't do a lot obviously fat loss is something that comes up with it's a lot of clients chapter, isn't it? yeah but it's not something that I would say that it, I, I, I can help people with it I can give them the tools mm -hmm. but I really struggle with the whole pushing people to calorie count and and think about I just it just doesn't you know, I think it's maybe highlighting even more emphasis on yeah. going down the route of the, the kind of niche that you want to go to. Absolutely, um, yeah. It's a hard one. It's a hard one to strike the balance with because it's like, who will will you be able to monetize that part to the same extent of maybe mm. those who are looking for? Um, I know training and that sort of stuff, but yeah, there's always yeah, there's always a little thought. You're like, yeah, fat loss coach and just e like <laughs> not saying it's easy. It's none of this is easy, mm. but um. But I know straight away that it's just yeah. not the part that yeah. I'm passionate about. I remember getting asked the question for personal training. It was like, you need to figure out your ideal client. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I've got Jill's mum at the time I was training in the garage, mm. recovered from breast cancer, 65 years old, never touched weights before, loving training her. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy asked me and he, he was like, what's well, like two of your favourite clients just now? So she came to mind. But then I had someone who was training for uh, the, N the NFL, uh, American football. Mm -hmm. And I really liked the performance side of things because it was nothing to do with fat loss and it felt different, it felt new. Yeah. 
And I was like, I can't pick between the 21 year old and the 65 yeah. year old. And that's the bit I'm always torn in is like, do you, I suppose, what is the niche? Is the niche maybe just helping people lift weights? Yeah. Is that really what it comes I down think to? I think these whole like avatar thing, it's like, you think once you decide on it, that's all you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, only going to get 65 year olds, nothing, yeah. no one so, older. Sorry, how old younger. are you? <laughs> 64, yeah, you need to come back yeah. next year. You need to come back there. Exactly. No, I try, that stressed me out, that whole yeah. idea of all, all of that. I, I think just, just keep doing your thing and it will attract the right yeah, types of people anyway. Absolutely. The fitness kind of question I had here was, do you get caught up in the whole wanting to do any of these sort of the hype stuff just now, which obviously High Rocks is one of them, running marathons, all these sort of stuff. Have you been caught up in that at all or is it not interesting Actually, much? no. Like I've not, um, High Rocks obviously is everywhere. Like I've not, I've not actually considered it. I've written myself a High Rocks workout to be like, just give it a go. <laughs> Don't be one of those people that's like, oh, not, you know, because you, you get a lot of people that then go against anything that's been hyped. And I don't want to be like that either. I want to be open to anything. Um, but no, I tend to just do like lift weights in the gym. I'm thinking back actually to that question, would you do resistance bands or weights? Probably weights if it was me. All right, yeah. I was thinking <laughs> more for the seniors and everyone else. But definitely weights if I had if I was mm. only allowed one. Lifting um, weights is the it's the cornerstone of everything. It is. Yeah. It absolutely Best is. Way to have it. And uh I just I just love training in the gym and doing, you know, you know, like squat, bench, deadlift, sometimes deadlift how I'm feeling um and like bodybuilding style workouts I still have an absolute love for for all of that Good. but there does come a point where you're like I need something yeah, to, the, uh, the new, yeah. The kind of new thing on the market to try out yeah and I do I enjoy running as well like that's what I did in school I did a bit of running and yeah, I was more built like things, a yeah. long distance runner <laughs> so I was like oh, embrace and this. swimming of course like normally yeah. longer limbs and that very suited towards swimming exactly I never really got into yeah. swimming no not many swimming pools up there <laughs> in um, the sea yeah yeah, the yeah in the north the currents. sea uh, but yeah just like just lifting weights and focusing on just getting stronger and honestly I think about when I'm you know training these older people and like if someone does fall over something like that like being strong enough to be able to help them you know and th when they ask me for help with something um George asked me to help him la lift a mattress not that long ago and I was like this is what I've been training for <laughs> yeah. and it was him and an older man and you know yeah. they're really struggling with it and I managed to like help them and I was like yes I'm strong enough it's own power and strength I think strength it is, really is. It, it's, it's kind of always branded as the power lifters or the big strong man and competitions and all that sort of stuff yeah. but it's far from that there's a lot more mm -hmm. to kind of get in terms of quality of life from it and that's yeah. what it is strength is relative as well it's not just a hundred kilo squat or whatever it is it's mm -hmm. like no lifting a mattress or um, stopping yourself from falling, holding on, picking someone up, all yep. these sort of things. Absolutely. Um, so one question to finish on here then, yep. if you had to envision what your life would look like in your 90s then, how would you how would you like that to look? Well, I'd want a really funny fitness instructor to do my classes <laughs> for me. Um, no, um, in my 90s, I would want to be living somewhere that was not too far from the city. I don't think I ever want to live really far away from like you uh, know how it was growing up. Yeah, right. I don't. I don't. I don't think I'm going to go back there and live there. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> um, but I think somewhere that's close enough that you can go and be part of the community, but that you've got plenty of space to be able to go out and walk around without being straight, you know, into. Because yeah. I do think about older people in the in the city now, and it's like if you straight out into like a busy environment because one of the the retirement homes i'm at it's you know the royal mile it's so busy right right um so having it's just tourism like yeah right the doorstep. and it's a really steep hill as yeah. well and cobbled Cobbles. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that and leo's cycling on that uh -huh. um how old is leo 98 wow um so yeah, like having that kind of best of both worlds where you can still go in and be part of it, but also um, have, yeah, have a bit of space. Mm -hmm. And then um, having another thing that keeps people young is children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, you know, it's like having to be there, having that that sense of like someone needing you, I think is is a massive thing for a lot of older people so you, i guess you've seen that from both sides like those who have quite a rich family and those who yeah for whatever reason ever chose to have kids and that sort yeah. of stuff so is that and emphasize that a bit more then yeah. yeah i would say so um i just think it's that 
yeah having have having someone there to visit you regularly you know not saying it doesn't need to be family by any means but having somebody there that's gonna like you know help help you in your later years and that that knows you as well because as much as I got to know you know John in those five years it's like what are the chances like there needs it's not the same as to know if somebody's no in your whole life like exactly how vulnerable can do you need to be to open up with all those things mm-hmm. and also even like talking about stories you're like oh, I forgot that happened but yeah someone that's experienced that with you yeah that's it as well and quality of life from a strength side of things you believe that you'll be able to see this new generation of mm-hmm. can I set the tone for oh yeah absolutely it would be very it. interesting to see your generation in the next 10-15 years mm-hmm. yeah it's going to be so different I mean everything is just so different now do think it'll be better or worse hmm. I don't know honestly I just everything with social media and everything right now it's all feeling very black mirror to me <laughs> so I, I don't know scary, what's yeah. gonna happen yeah <laughs> Elon Musk is making robots oh. it's, it's getting out of hand eh? yeah so Wally is upon us mm-hmm. better everything's gonna be better that's <laughs> it <laughs> you have that uh, John's mentality that look like just that's it Kind of chase after it. That's it. Yeah. But one thing that will fight against it is the whole lifting weights and resistance training. So that's really what separates. Do you see that much just now with your like peers and friends, like those who don't necessarily consistently lift or that sort of things, like quality of life deteriorating from a younger age than maybe what it was before? Yeah, it was so active. Oh, definitely, definitely. I think it's um, you know, things like posture and all that you see the difference between somebody who's even just aware of their body and aware of you know movements and how they move the difference between that and somebody who's not is massive yeah um and that again it's all related because then nutrition comes into it and just being you know being active in general mm-hmm. it all ties into just being a yeah. healthy more resilient person um, so I do notice a difference, but I try, you know, with friends and family, I do try and like, try not to be too pushy, but. No, no. Uh, it's a hard one. I don't think, it's weird because if the, there was you, a version of you that wasn't in the family that was communicating the same message, yeah. had a strong relationship with them, yeah. they'd probably listen to. Yeah, uh, an authority I imagine, so, figure. Yeah, the, in the senior community, they probably have. Them, there'll be surely one grandson or even son that's our um, granddaughter, daughter, it's in the fitness space where it's like yeah I'm not listening to her but I'm going to listen mm-hmm. to Kerry because Kerry's the one yeah. that's here uh, so it'll be interesting yeah. well yeah like it's an absolute pleasure to have you on thank you so much for yeah, sharing your thank story you. Um I'll leave a link to all your stuff below Um if people do want to inquire work with you have you got mm-hmm. space and all that sort of stuff do you do any online or is it more in person? Um, like no, I do the, online, like, yeah. So I work from a gym. I do one-to-one in the gyms. Um, and I am hoping to start more more classes, senior classes as well. Um, and, yeah, oh, It's going to be an it, exciting, so. exciting next year. I know, year. We'll watch see where this you're at. space. Definitely things are going to happen. Good, good. You've put it out there now. Yep, that's it. Manifest Universe, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for yeah, coming on. Yeah, thanks.